All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 3rd, 2024. Oh, yes, we are in June, brothers and sisters. We're getting there. Day by day, we're so much closer. Well, tonight is going to be an exciting video. You can see we don't have all these tabs to go through today. We are going through these tabs today. So as much as it's not as many tabs as we're used to, it is going to be a lot of video clip watching. And in particular, we're going to watch one video that is about 40 minutes long and change. We're going to watch all this video. You're going to understand why. For those that are uh, a part of the ministry in the forum, uh, I posted about this video and another one. I'm not going to show both. I'm just going to show one and just briefly talk about the other one because it's all kind of discussed in the main video I'm going to show. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because most people, now I know a lot of people here in this ministry, we're really digging, we're really paying attention, and not only digging more so in Scripture, but we're also paying attention to things going on around the world and, you know, what's going on with AI and how, how much it's drastically changing everything. Now, we've spoken in part on some of these things, but very, very little. Uh, what you're going to see here tonight is 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 really going to blow your mind because whether it's the people on the positive side of things of what ai is bringing or whether they're on the negative side you're going to see something spectacular they see the same time frame that scripture has revealed through this ministry here that within the next 13 to 15 years is when all of this, not only bang, it just suddenly happens, but is this period of time where it all starts to take place. And they all have the same ending time frame, the same period of time that we've been revealing from Scripture for over six years. It's really quite fascinating. But I, as we go through this video and, and listen to what these experts I'm talking about the experts, the ones that are in conferences, the ones that are part of the companies, the ones that are that are giving uh, um, talks to Congress and to business leaders and governments around the world. The, the one guy <coughs> who I'm going to show the video about, this guy has another video um, that I'm going to just show you when I when we get to him that was even talking to the Saudis. And when you realize what he's telling the Saudis, you think, man, you think they would have just, they, they probably all want to dismiss him. They all either want to dismiss him and think there's absolutely no way. We're worth $2 trillion. We're good. They probably wanted to kill the guy when you hear what he says. Because we are right now, because it's already begun since they launched ChatGPT. It's now out in the world and all of these different companies, small and large, are working on it. Some try to slow it. Some want to speed it down. Some want everybody to pause. It's impossible to put it back in the box. And when you hear of what's happening, how it's changing things, how drastically it's going to change everything, you're going to remember something. And I'm going to show it because those of you who haven't been around long enough, I'm going to show you something that we shared in this exact same time frame from a video about a book that I read that talked about this same time frame. It is so incredible, but when you hear of the change that's coming to the world, that's already just the tip tip of the iceberg begun, and how fast it's coming, I hope and pray we have understood this timing with the Lord. Because if it's not the Lord's time and the Lord allowing this and bringing this about, then it will be man. You'll see as we get through all this. That means man is what's going to bring about this, this end of days that the Lord talks about and not a scripture? No, I don't think so. It's not going to be a man-made utopia at the end when man always wants to control everything. You'll see again as we get going into all that. So... <clears throat> so buckle up we're going to go through all that 
and then I'm going to bring it back to the scriptures to tie it all up in the in the latter portion and say, similar to whatever the title might be, now you guys decide. Do you really think this is the year? Do I think the Lord is going to suddenly let somebody know? I don't think so. Not until maybe moments before, right? We've spoke about this before, that remnant group of workers that will be informed, but they're not going to be informed days before or months before. It might just be hours or moments before so that they could be ready knowing that the bride is being taken and that they're going to remain to prepare themselves when he returns from the wedding. Outside of that, I don't believe it's going to happen. Might it? Sure. Would everybody believe even if it did? Probably not. So why don't we use the evidence of what's really taking place in the world and apply it to Scripture? Because what's happening now is nothing, is nothing compared to the things we thought had been happening in the past. It is really, really quite incredible. So let's get going and let's start as I always do. For anybody that's new or newer to the ministry, oh man, I had an exciting weekend. My wife and I went out for um, for lunch. I think it was on Sunday. We went to Denny's. Nothing fancy. We went to Denny's and we were sitting at a table of two and behind my wife there were two ladies. And we didn't know who the one was, but I could see the other lady that was facing us. And she was all excited. Her name was Sally and she's she's talking about prophecy and how the Lord has led her into prophecy and all these things started opening and people think she's crazy because they're just not paying attention. They're not seeking it out. And my wife and I are just giggling. We're like, you know, that's that's right up our alley, right? That is a brother or a sister, in this case, a sister who is ready, who is who the spirit is leading to to receive revelation, to be to really dig in and understand thirsty for the truth. And so I'm telling my wife and my wife's like, yeah, yeah, get your cards out, right? So if they finish lunch first, I'll, I'll stand up and introduce myself. If we finish first, I'll just walk over there. Well, lo and behold, <clears throat> I never saw the lady who was behind my wife because her back was to us. And we finish our lunch before they do. I get up to go introduce myself. And I look to my left. And the woman on the left was my son. They used to go to a private Christian school when they were little kids for a few years. And the teacher was his, my son and my daughters, but specifically my son's uh, kindergarten and grade one teacher. And oh my goodness. So my wife's there and it was such a joy just to see her again. Everybody remembers her. They remember our kids all the time as well. And uh, so then, man, I start laying in. <laughs> you know, I'm trying not to go too, too far. But I know both being Christians and and the one just on fire for script for uh, prophecy, man, we had fun. We were talking for about 10, 15 minutes and she was like, thank you, Lord. This is so awesome. Right. She was so excited. So what did I tell her? And this is why it just dawned on me now, because like I tell everybody, start with the intro series. So I gave her little tidbits about the intro series, uh, you know, even talking about the number of years for tribulation. And my goodness, uh, it was just exciting. So. She she knows about the website. Hopefully she'll uh, she's checking it out, and uh, maybe one day we'll leave her, even see her in the forum. So when people hear me talking about the forum, <clears throat> excuse me, you can go to ministryrevealed.com right here, and when you click on the menu, you can just come right down here and click on forum. It'll take a few seconds to sign up. And it costs you nothing. There's over 1,200 people worldwide and a number of people in there sharing all sorts of things, Bible studies, things they're finding, prayer requests, news, events, all sorts of things going on. So this, there's two places you can go for the intro series. You can go right here in the playlist. And also, you can go to the menu here on the website in the intro page. When you come to the intro page, the first four videos are the same first four videos that you see on the playlist on YouTube. This one is a 22-minute intro of little insights of what you're going to see in the next three. Every video is downloadable, a one-click download, or you can just watch it. If there's any uh, study notes like the next one has, you can click on this. The study notes will pop up, and you can print them or download them as well. Everything's free. So... 
This is the second video. It's a 30-minute introduction Bible study to the revelation of what these differences are within the Gospels. We call it who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end of days, you know, we were told in Scripture, the last will be first, the first will be last. Well, we have three synoptic Gospels, and John then stands on his own. We have understanding. We've revealed why John stands on his own and why there are three synoptic Gospels. And we were told the first will be last, the last will be first. So Matthew, Mark, Luke means Luke, Mark, Matthew. And it turns out that in Luke's Gospel, for one little piece that you'll find in this, is on the way to the cross, Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful, like a bride, right? In Mark's, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet, right? Not because they were colorblind, because there's something deeper going on. And we find this with all of the differences within the Gospels. It turns out they are all prophecy, and we have revealed here dozens and dozens and dozens of them. In fact, once you get through these first four, you want to go deeper? This one is a three-hour video just on the differences in the Gospels and how they reveal prophecy in the is to come. The was is from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And from the moment of the pre-trib to the end is the is to come. What was shall be what is shall be meaning you will find the typology of end time understanding in the was and the is that will reveal to you the is to come and these differences in the gospels man oh man if you have ever questioned the differences in gospels catching something that was different in each one and you you couldn't understand why you're now going to understand for the first time you're going to see it be revealed and you're going to dig into it and understand it i promise you it will be so exciting you know, so when you see the, the purple and the scarlet, what are tribulation colors? Purple and scarlet. The woman riding the beast is arrayed in purple and scarlet. They're tribulation colors. So you're going to find incredible things like this, and you're going to find out what it starts to mean as well. You're going to find out that pre, mid, and post-trib are all true. That people, there's a reason they can go to Scripture and debate their positions, whether they're pre, mid, and post. How can they do that from Scripture if not all of them are true? The answer is revealed in the Gospels. All three are true. And you're going to begin to understand it in this first 30-minute Bible study about the differences in the Gospels. Then what you're going to realize is that the end of days is not a period of seven years, but of 14 years years it is going to be 14 years long seven years of seals seven years of trumpets not one year one seal one year one trumpet they're gonna some will start some will end some will continue some will overlap okay but it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets and there's a period called above that above is a period of 50 days we've got some incredible videos that really go into the depth of it as well and then when you really want to understand this more clearly and you've gone through the first four and after you've gone through being able to understand the gospels better this is where you will see the revelation of the discourses luke's is the 40 days of that 50 day period mark's is the seven years of seals and matthew's is the seven years of trumpets going from matthew 24 all the way into matthew 25 to the end it i promise you if you've ever tried to understand or desired to understand prophecy before, you've come to the right place. The Spirit has led you. Then you come to the fourth video. This one is a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. And just as it says, it's all because of Matthew. Why wasn't what you're about to watch, why wasn't it understood before? For one, it wasn't yet the time of the Lord's revealing. That's one. But two... It's because everybody for hundreds of years has been taught Scripture from the foundation of the Gospel of Matthew. They only look to Mark and to Luke for little added tidbit of details here and there because they're looking through the eyes of the is, not the is to come. And so whenever there's a discrepancy, they, they'll stay away from Mark and they'll stay away from Luke and they'll just read it from the teachings of Matthew. But Matthew is to Judah. And Judah is the seven years of trumpets. You see, they've missed 
the seven years that belong to Mark, which is the world, the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in, the, the church that's not ready and watching and diligently seeking the Lord. The Lord is looking for a Gentile bride. He's looking for a bride who is spotless, who, who is repentant, who loves him, who's diligently seek him, seeking him as Enoch did. That's who he's looking for. He's not looking for a church that's wishy-washy, that's lukewarm, that, oh, yeah, I go to church. Well, but don't talk to me about those things. No, no, I, I don't want to hear that stuff. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking for a ready, diligently seeking, loving, repentant bride that just wants to be with him. You see, the Mark group is the world that will be left and the church that wasn't prepared. That remnant portion, that leftover piece, which is like 90% of the church that will be left. And the Luke portion is a period before it all starts that will begin with the pre-trib. You will come to see that the pre-trib happens at the beginning of the 50 days. Then, at the end of the 50 days, it will all begin the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets. In the seventh year of seals, about the midpoint of the seventh year of seals, is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And then, the post-trib return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives, is at the start of the seventh year of trumpets. So why has everybody only seen 7,000 years of creation? Why does everybody only see seven years of tribulation? Because they've all seen it through the lens and through the foundational understanding of Matthew, and they didn't even know it. But once you understand who the Gospels are written to, you'll understand the end of days. More has been revealed than ever before, and I promise you it'll be worth every moment of your time. Study over it, pray over it, and you'll see for yourself. And then you can go into the real deep stuff. It's so awesome. It's absolutely incredible. In fact, oh, and the seven churches. That's an awesome, awesome teaching. Another mystery that people had been seeking for centuries. We've revealed it here. And here's a big one. <clears throat> this is the big one. It's all a fractal. From the beginning of creation to the end of tribulation and the end of the millennial reign, the whole thing is the fractal story. It's fantastic. So take your time, study those things out, and you will see prophecy reveal itself as you've never seen before, and you will understand it as you've never seen before. So, where do we get started? This guy right here. <clears throat> this guy, his name is Tony Seba. You can see uh, Tony Seba is a world-renowned author, speaker, educator, and entrepreneur. He follows, he, he teaches and has been studying with his team what's called S-curves. So an S-curve, okay, just like, you know, it starts off down here and it goes up and it does this, or it starts off up here and it goes down like this. And he's related this for, I mean, going back in history and history and history, it goes through everything. In one of his videos, in his teachings, he even shows it with the automobile. You know, he has one picture where he shows there's one car and everybody else in the picture is riding a horse. 13 years later, he has another picture. It's 13 years after the first one was taken. Everybody's driving a car except for one person riding a horse. That's an S-curve. As the price is expensive at first, think like the Tesla when it came out, what, 80, 90,000? And now they're going down to like, what, 25,000? Well, he shows they're even going down further than that. But Tesla isn't the only one in the market. You'll see what I'm talking about. I'm going to prove it to you with even news that's taking place right now. He talks about it with solar. <clears throat> he talks about it with, with battery, with wind. And then he also talks about it with robotics, right? With, with the actual robots being built and AI. <coughs> Excuse me. Think about how long it takes to bring about eight billion, or 1 billion people on the earth to grow them up so that they could be at a point where they could be product, productive workers in society. It takes like 20 years if you had 1 billion born at once. Robots? One billion can be made in one year. It's wild. And he goes in and he teaches all over the world on these things. So if you want to check him out, this is his channel. 
so you can see the number of videos I was watching on it. This one right here, <clears throat> the Great Transformation, is the one I was going to show you right here. I'm not going into this one, though. He's talking to Saudi Arabia and a bunch of Saudis about how long it will take before their oil needs for the world are obsolete. Done. Gone. Finished. You see, I was buying into some of this new stuff. I was buying into things I had heard recently about how the the uh, electric cars and how everything was really tanking and, <clears throat> you know, uh, Volkswagen really wasn't, uh, um, isn't getting into it as much anymore. And they're going to go more hybrid format. Nope. <clears throat> it wasn't true. If you dig behind the story, you find out more in detail why they're not doing it. And it's because they were losing at least $20,000 per car if they were selling them at $35,000. <clears throat> Excuse me. But they have no choice but to lower the car prices. So they're trying to stay out of it for as long as they can because the bulk of all the minerals that are needed in known reserves on the earth are in China. They're in China. It's, it's really incredible. And when you see the prices that the vehicles are coming into America soon from China, what the prices are, you're going to say, oh, my goodness. It's the whole reason Biden added a 100% tariff on vehicles coming from China. And even with the 100% tariff, they're cheaper than the cheapest Tesla's about to come out. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And I bought into it because of what others, you know, the some big companies and big corporations were saying. But the reasons they're saying it is because they're falling behind the eight ball. They're all falling behind, falling behind, falling behind. And they're going to be wiped out. Everything, brothers and sisters, over the next 14 years. Yep. Everything that we know, as they've been telling us, Everything is going to change. This AI is going to be drastic. Now, again, please understand, I'm not saying this to put a fear in you and, and to, to get you all riled up in this. I have studied these things. I've spent time. I've watched these teachings. I've gone into the things they've said. I'm going to show you some of the clips <clears throat> proving that the things that he taught on, that he explained for the last 10 years, and the things that he explained 15 years ago that have already come to pass, that he said would happen in 10 years, they're happening just as he had said it's going everything is changing guys it's real it's true and corporations all over the world are going to be gone multi-billion dollar corporations will be gone my wife works for one of the biggest ones in canada uh trans canada pipeline used to be called um what was it uh i think it used to be called trans canada pipeline now it's called tc energy and they're all oil and gas. It's not that it's it's just all going to go away at once. It's going to be a, a steady progression of it all going away at once. Or of it all going away. What on earth? If, what, what are people going to do? What do they tell us? Well, Elon and everybody, they and all of these guys, talk about, and we've mentioned it in the past, that there's going to be a universal basic income. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know right now, that universal basic income that's coming is going to have strings attached. And those strings will be the coming mark of the beast. Do you see how this ties together? How all of this is perfectly aligned? It looks like, like if you, when you really dig into this and you study this, you think, oh my goodness. It almost sounds like, like it's the end of days that man, through the enemy, is bringing about this way himself. Do you think that's going to happen? Do you think it's, it's going to be man that's going to bring it about, and at the end of about 14, 15 years from now, it's going to be a utopia for the world? And nobody will have any work, and they'll be able to go into their own creative ways of things? 
Or do you think there will be those controlling the whole show and all of this stuff would be controlled? Of course. Which means what? This is why as much as it made me like intense and intense in studying these things, the excitement was realizing what this was telling us. It really has begun. And they all, from a positive side or a negative side, are both saying we have 13 to 15 years before all of this is now full-fledged, finished, and it's either a utopia or the robots are coming after men. That's, that's, their, that's their summation of the end of 13 to 15 years from now. The summation is we're all going to be living in a utopia-type life and a free energy because everything, the prices will drop on everything. Everything will drop. Everything. So everything will get so much less, like pennies on the dollar for energy, for all of it. Or the robots will be hunting us. And both have the same time frame. And here we've been saying the last year, 2024, everything in scripture is pointing to 2024. Here's the uh, website and the team this uh, Tony Skiba has. He's, he talks about it with wind, solar, battery, battery energy, because all of these things, you're going to hear how they've dropped. And everybody laughed at him 10 years ago when he was saying they would drop 80 to 90 percent within 10 years for solar and the cost of solar. And guess what? It dropped 82 percent right in the time frame. So now this guy, people are coming to him and he's giving talks all over the place. And he has been for a while, but now it's really broken through because he did the same thing for, for the electric vehicles. He said within 10 years, they'll be down to about $11,400. I'm going to show you from when he said that a year ago, they're now even coming out cheaper. He shows it with food. He shows that land, all of the agricultural land around the world that is the size of America, Australia, look at this, within 15 years. In Australia, uh, America, and the size of China, all three of them combined, all of that land will become available because there will be no more livestock needed, no more growing corn and all of these wheats and everything else. They can make it. That's what he's talking about here. He says it's not maybe coming. It's all already happening. What Have we seen robots explode in the last couple of years in what they can do, and especially the last six months? If you've been looking at these things, absolutely. You're going to hear about solar, the batteries, the cars getting so much cheaper. All of this has already begun. You see? coming age of freedom because he's on the positive side of things let's have a listen this is the video that we're going to watch from the electric viking guy and we're going to watch i believe the the whole 45 minutes so i'll probably pause it on occasion and jump in but i'm watching these videos on uh 1.25 so if you're listening really fast maybe you can slow it down a little bit on your end but just to help it maybe be a little bit faster for us on our end so let's have a listen. We've all been wondering what's going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years. I mean, only if only we had a crystal ball, what will happen? Well, Tony Sieber and Rethic X have just told us. Now, Sieber has made many predictions which have come true. And people thought they were crazy. They thought they were just absolutely mind-blowingly insane until, wow, funny enough, it happened. So if you want to know what's going to happen over the next 10, 20, even 30 years, well, Tony Sieber has just told us. Now, insanely, this information has been up on the internet for a couple of days. And almost no one has even noticed. This is absolutely mind-blowing information, which will tell you with almost zero uncertainty exactly what is going to go on over the next 10 to 20 years. And it's actually quite mind-blowing, a little bit frightening, and also very, very intriguing. The media daily reports complete horseshit just constantly. You're reading nonsense. That's what's on YouTube primarily. It's what the the mass media is feeding you. But Tony Sieber and Rethink X and his team 
I've just revealed what is going to happen in the future. I mean, literally spelt it out. These guys have made predictions which have come true uh, on nearly every occasion now since 2014. If you want to get rich, just basically listen to what they're saying and you can bet that almost certainly their predictions will be correct. However, what the media has not done is report on Sieber's predictions that came out two days ago. And they should have, because that, my friends, is the true answer to where the world is heading. And it's a little bit scary. You know what? Sieber is not sugarcoating it. He's, um, he's telling what's really going to happen. I think we, we all should be a little concerned. Here's the truth from Tony Sieber. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. I'm Sam Evans. You're watching The Electric Viking. It's great to see you. I was inspired by Tony Sieber to create this channel. So I used to sit at home and watch him speak, and not just him, but other other professors and also by Singularity University, Peter Armandus. And you know what? They made me realize the world was changing at the fastest pace in human history. And this is in some ways good and in some ways bad, but it's better to be educated. And listening to the media who are completely disinterested in anything that's of any real substance will probably rot your brains. Sieber says that in the 15 years between 1907 and 1922, horses went from providing 95% of all private vehicle miles traveled on American roads to less than 20%. With Wayfair, finding your style is fun. Grab in a chair. It doesn't matter if it's your outdoor style or not. We'll have to deal with some of those. 95% but less than 20% in a very short space of time. In areas like New York City, which led to the adoption of automobiles, the disruption of transportation was swift and transformative. As shown in these images, um, automobiles within only 13 years basically completely replaced horses in major cities. The disruption of horses by automobiles in the 20th century followed a characteristic pattern that we have seen throughout history, says Siba. Adoption of the new technology follows an S-shaped growth curve, while abandonment of the older technology collapses accordingly. Together, these form what Rethink X calls a disruption X-curve. Disruptions of all kinds follow this same pattern. Elon Musk is talking about this lately. Um, Siba has been mentioning this, and it seems like people just aren't listening. We are on the cusp, says Siba, of a new disruption, physical labor performed by humanoid farm robots. This time, we are the horses. We are about to be replaced. Now, I've Googled this on Reddit. There's people talking about this stuff on Reddit. They're all saying, don't worry, uh, you'll, you'll be able to be retrained and you can just do a different job. No. Yeah, that has happened for the last 200, 300, 400 years. You've been able to be retrained. New, new machines come in and people work out how to use those machines and they, that's not going to happen this time, says Siba. You should be very concerned. You should be investing everything you can right now. Just as internal combustion engines gave automobiles the capability to disrupt horses, a convergence of technologies that together create what we call a labor engine is what gives humanoid robots the capability to completely disrupt human labor. The critical disruptive components of the new labor engine include sensors, cameras, tilt sensors, pressure sensors, microphones, accelerometers, um, every kind of sensor you can imagine, and they are remarkably cheap computer hardware and software to process sensory data with powerful artificial intelligence. We have never seen the kind of artificial intelligence um, before, and it's coming much, much faster than we realize. Actuators to move and interact with objects in the environment, batteries and power electronics to provide energy for hours of sensing, computing, and moving. These new humanoid robots, they can learn at a pace a billion times faster than any human being that's ever been born in human history. That includes Elon Musk, that includes uh, Albert Einstein. They learn from each other instantly. You cannot possibly dream of competing with that. Each of these technologies... Okay. What did we just hear? <clears throat> that they will all be able to also learn from each other, right? You guys might remember one video clip. I'm going to show just the, the starting portion of this. Because they learn from each other. So this is so fascinating and scary because as soon as it's learned, the other ones know it, right? If they're, if they're in that, that same network of of within that company then they all know it instantly so check this out you guys might, might remember a part of this i've shared this uh, i believe i shared this in the past we'll listen to um the first uh well we'll listen to about five minutes here and then the rest will be for the latter portion why does the subject matter that we're about to talk about matter to the person that's just clicked on this podcast to listen it's the most existential uh, debate and challenge humanity will ever face. This is bigger than climate change, way bigger than COVID. Uh, this will redefine the way the world is.
So if you've ever liked any of the videos we've posted, if you like this channel, can you do me a quick favor and hit the subscribe button? It helps this channel more than you know, and the bigger the channel gets, as you've seen, the bigger the guests get. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Why does the subject matter that we're about to talk about matter to the person that's just clicked on this podcast to listen? It's the most existential uh, debate and challenge humanity will ever face. This is bigger than climate change, way bigger than COVID. Uh, this will redefine the way the world is in unprecedented uh, sh shapes and forms within the next few years. This is imminent. It is the change is not, we're not talking 2040. We're talking 2025, 2026. Do you think this is an emergency? I don't like the word. Uh, it is uh, an urgency. Uh, it, there is a point of no return and we're getting closer and closer to it. It's going to reshape the way we do things and the way we look at life. Uh, the quicker we respond, uh, um, you know, proactively and at least intelligently to that, the better we will all be positioned. Uh, but if we panic, uh, we will repeat COVID all over again, which in my view is probably the worst thing we can do. What, what's your background and when did you first come across artificial intelligence? I uh, I had those two wonderful lives. One of them was a, uh, you know, what what we spoke about the first time we met, you know, my work on happiness and, and uh, you know, being uh, one billion happy and my mission and so on. That's my second life. My first life was, uh, it started as a geek at age seven. Uh, you know, for a very long part of my life, I understood mathematics better than spoken words. And, uh, and I was a very, very serious computer programmer. I wrote code uh, well into my 50s. And during that time, I led very large technology organizations for very big chunks of their business. First, I was um, vice president of emerging markets of Google for seven years. So I took Google to the next 4 billion users, if you want. So the idea of uh, not just opening sales offices, but really building or contributing to building the technology that would allow people in Bengali to find what they need on the internet, required establishing the internet to start. And then I became business chief business officer of Google X and my work at Google X was really about the connection between innovative technology and the real world. And we had quite a big chunk of AI and quite a big chunk of robotics uh, that resided within uh, within Google X. Uh, we had a uh, an experiment of um, a farm of grippers, if you know what those are. So robotic arms that are attempting to grip something. Most people think that, you know, what you have in a Toyota fa factory is a robot, uh, you know, an artificially intelligent robot. It's not. It's a it's a high precision machine. You know, if the if the sheet metal is moved by one micron, you, it wouldn't be able to pick it. And one of the big problems in computer science was how do you code a machine that can actually pick the sheet metal if it moved by, a you know, a millimeter? And and we were basically saying intelligence is the answer. So we had a large enough farm and we attempted to let those um, those grippers uh, work on their own. Basically, you put a, a, a little uh, basket of uh, children toys in front of them and uh, and they would you know monotonously go down attempt to pick something fail show the arm to the camera so the, ca the, the the transaction is locked as it you know this pattern of movement with that texture and that material didn't work until eventually you know i uh, the farm was on the second floor of the building and i my office was on the third and so i would walk by it every now and then and go like yeah you know this is not gonna work and then one day um friday after lunch I am going back to my office and one of them in front of my eyes, you know, lowers the arm and picks a yellow ball, soft toy, basically soft yellow ball, which again is a coincidence. It's not science at all. It's like if you keep trying a million times, you one time it will be right. And it shows it to the camera. It's logged as a yellow ball. And I joke about it, you know, going to the third floor saying, hey, we spent all of those millions of dollars for a yellow ball. And yeah, Monday morning, every one of them is picking every yellow ball. A couple of weeks later, every one of them is picking everything. Right, and and it it hit me very very strongly. One, the speed, okay, uh, the capability. I mean, understand that we take those things for granted, but for. So did you hear that, man? When I first heard this, I was like, "What? Do you understand? Nobody taught those arms how to do it. It would just they had all of these AI electronic arms, and they would just all go in, try to pick up, show the camera nothing, try to pick up, show the camera nothing, try, and they had a whole bunch of them until one did it and when one did it by the following monday they were all doing it two weeks later they were picking up every single toy do you know how that was programmed it wasn't that's the scary part of ai that's the whole point of why ai there's there's a side that is very optimistic and there's the side which he's on because he was there when it started he saw it 
and he retired. He gave his resignation and he went out to start writing a book and to start giving talks on the things that could come from AI. Because if it doesn't like something, it will figure it out. And if it turns on humans, nothing could stop it. So, because why? Because it learns on its own. That's the thing about AI. Nothing is programmed in the sense of how it learns. It could do it on its own. So it has all the capabilities now of going into everything available on the internet. So it knows everything that has ever been published. And then what happens? Well, then it learns from itself in different ways of, of, of rearranging things, of doing things, of making things cheaper for us as we then use it, as these guys then use it to figure these things out. And that's what everybody is racing at doing right now. Making these things cheaper, accessible, lowering this. Everything goes down so cheap. We need a universal basic income because every job will be replaced because these robots that get built will have this understanding, these knowledges within them. It's wild. It is absolutely science fiction. Well, was science fiction. Back to the other one has gotten dramatically cheaper and more powerful in recent years, setting the stage for disruption of labor worldwide. This is what Tesla is planning to capitalize on. Now, you may be thinking the Tesla bot, oh, it's not as capable as what it should be compared to other robots. It's not really about that. It's about the artificial intelligence, it's about the neural networks involved here. And Tesla believes it can essentially do what Siba is predicting and completely disrupt the global labor market, which is worth trillions of dollars. Over the next 15 to 20 years, says Siba, humanoid robots will disrupt human labor throughout hundreds like, see, this is just folding a shirt. But once it knows how to do it like this, it can get faster, and every other one of them knows how to do it. And so on, and so forth, and so on, and so forth. Hundreds of industries across every major sector of the global economy. You're not safe. The disruption of labor will be among the most profound transformations in human history, and therefore simultaneously represent one of the greatest opportunities and greatest challenges our civilization has ever faced. Now, what do you think Elon Musk has been talking about? Um, people, people basically having what he calls UBI, which is universal basic income. Elon Musk has been talking about this for more than 10 years, UBI, UBI, UBI. People will need a universal basic income because they will. And now remember, we're gonna talk about what we know prophetically in relation to this UBI, as I was saying in the beginning. This UBI, when it really comes about, it's not just coming about at the beginning because there's just so much change and, and the robots are going to end up taking more and more and AI systems are going to take over more and more and more. Yeah, that's what's coming in man's played out version as things progress over the next even couple of years. But do you think that's really how it's going to play out? Not when you understand prophecy. We're going to talk about what's going to come first. What's going to need to come first that will have everybody on their knees begging for somebody to rescue them. And when they do, what time is that? It's the time of the mark of the beast. But it doesn't come till after some major things happen first. Not only the pre-trib, but World War III. We'll share on a point in that as well in a bit will be, well, replaced or displaced. Siva says that the humanoid robot labor disruption is inevitable. Throughout history, every time technology has enabled a 10 times or greater cost reduction relative to the incumbent system, a disruption has always followed. Each dollar spent on an automobile or an LED light bulb or a digital camera delivers more than 10 times the utility of each dollar spent on a horse, incandescent bulb, a film camera, respectively. For millennia, these and hundreds of other disruptive technologies have driven sweeping transformations across every aspect of human life. Put it very simply, the cost investment to build a human robot in the future will be a fraction of the value it can provide. Basically building, say, a Tesla bot might cost Tesla 10,000 US dollars, but that bot could create millions of dollars in value. It doesn't call in sick to work. It doesn't complain. It learns every day from every other robot working on the factory floor in every factory possibly for that brand worldwide. It can work 24 hours a day. It doesn't need to sleep. Humans cannot possibly compete with this technology. Today, we are on the cusp of the most profound disruption of human labor since the advent of electricity and combustion engines over a century ago, says Siba. 
As in many markets, there will be high-end and low-end humanoid robot offerings once deployment begins in earnest. For the purposes of illustration, says Siba, consider a humanoid robot with a total lifetime cost of $200,000 that works 20,000 hours before decommissioning. Its labor cost would be $10 per hour. Even at this very high cost point, humanoid robots are already competitive with human labor in a substantial fraction of the global economy. In reality, lifetime costs of humanoid robots are likely to be far less than $200,000 right from the start. Uh, Tesla is saying that they plan on selling a Tesla bot, literally for the price of a car, and that's a lot less than $200,000. Siba says that humanoid robots will enter the market at a cost capability of under $10 an hour for their labor, and they won't get tired on a trajectory to under $1 an hour before 2035 and under 10 cents per hour before 2045. Could you potentially, could anyone, Crazy. even in the third world, I mean, even in the developing world, compete with a humanoid bot that works out of 10 cents or less per hour? Uh, this is what Sebra is predicting. He's saying that basically we have 20 years left before it's game over for humans. He's even saying that we don't really have 20 years because on a trajectory to under $1 an hour before 2035. Now, Sebra has gotten most of his predictions right. He's even been a little conservative. If he's saying 2035 under $1 an hour, I mean, even if he's off base and it's $5 an hour, can you compete with that? Are you willing to work for $4 an hour and work harder than a robot and not complain and uh, not get paid union fees and all this stuff? I mean, honestly, if this is true, and I suspect it is because this is Tony Sebra we're talking about, then... Uh, I don't know what I need to do. I need to do something because a, a robot will replace me too. This alone makes the disruption of a substantial fraction of human labor inevitable. Siba says that humanoid robots will work more than three times as many hours per week as a person in any conditions, dangerous conditions in particular, without vacations, without illnesses, without complaint, for a total of perhaps 7,000 hours per year. But at the same time that costs are falling, capability will grow. At first, he says, humanoid robots will only be able to perform relatively simple tasks. But with each day that passes, their capabilities will grow until by the 2040s, they will be able to do virtually anything a human can do and much, much more. It'd be like being, um, for example, a doctor and an engineer and also a teacher in the one person. And there's probably a few people that can do all those things, but not very many. I actually used to sell apartments for $9.45 an hour. I had a wife and two kids that I had. Siba says, remember that humanoid robots today are the most expensive and least capable that they will ever be. He's right. I mean, tomorrow they'll get better and cheaper and the next day and the next day. Humanoid robots are what Rethink X calls a disruption from below. Initially, they will be cheaper per hour mm. than hiring a human worker in many regions, but also less capable, slower, less competent, less adaptable. We have seen disruptions from below many times before, such as digital cameras. It's true, digital cameras did kind of suck at the start, didn't they? And the response from incumbents to predictable. They mock the new technology. I've seen this on Reddit. They mock it, they are, for being lower performing while ignoring the rate at which the new technology gets better and cheaper. Until See, this is exactly what I was talking about in relation to the automobile industry. A lot of them are just mocking it, saying, oh, no, it's not going to happen. You know, there's not enough charging stations. There's not enough this. There's not enough that. There's not enough power. What about enough electricity for the grid to be able to handle all of these things? <clears throat> and so a lot of them will say, oh, it's just never going to happen, and they're going to be left behind. They'll be the blockbusters, right? They'll be those that, that didn't switch in their, when cameras were flipping over. Uh, all of these types of things, right? The old record player type thing. And they'll just be these the, these things that we like for little fun things that we've done in the past. That's that's essentially what he's talking about on a scale of everything. Wild. It is too late to respond and they face collapse. It's a little bit like what people have done with electric cars. They mock them. They said they were golf carts. Well, look what's happened. Sebus said... And, and in fact, in relation to uh, the, the power and the, the you know renewable energy... In relation to the vehicles, the EVs, I watched an incredible video, uh, documentary type style video on Norway. I'm sure if we have, I know we have brothers and sisters from Norway here in the ministry. I, what Norway has done over the last century is beyond anything any other country has done for its citizens, uh, for a sovereign wealth fund for every man, woman, and child because of its oil and gas reserves and and how it established it. 
every man, woman, and child has a net worth in the government because of the revenues that it generates of 295,000 US dollars for every man, woman, child, and child. It caps how much it could use at 3% of this fund. It owns 1.5 1. or 1.6% of all stocks in the stock market in this, in this Norwegian fund. And what they've done is they have dams that were built you know, many, many decades ago. And they're now harnessing solar and wind, especially wind because of where they are, to power their entire nation so that they continue to just sell all their oil and gas and everything else. And as they build up an excess, I think now they're at about 85%, as they build up an excess of this renewable energy, they will sell it to their neighboring nations. But what they're doing now is they've offered rewards, like uh, incentives, for everybody to buy electric vehicles so that they can use this source through the renewable energies that they have so things get even cheaper. And last year, 80% of all new vehicles sold in Norway, a population of about 5 million, were all EVs. 80% were EVs. And other ma automakers are like, no, it's going nowhere. No, it's just a big ruse. No, nope, it's happening. It really is. I was, I was a little bit somewhat skeptical and a little bit duped, and sometimes I wasn't. And then I started really digging in. It's all happening, guys. So is it all going to happen like this? Or is the Lord going to make it with his move? Yes, that the disruption will create an entirely new labor system. This is what we call the phase change disruption. Phase change disruptions create entirely new and much larger systems with new properties, new business models, and new metrics. Electricity wasn't just cheaper whale oil, says Siba. Automobiles weren't just faster horses. Farming wasn't just more productive hunting and gathering. It was an entirely new paradigm. And the internet wasn't just an easier way to send letters, read newspapers, or listen to music. These disruptions created vastly larger and more capable systems of energy, transportation, food, and information delivering orders of magnitude, more kilowatt hours, passenger and freight miles, calories and pictures, news stories, songs, shows, and other content respectively. The new systems had radically different properties that required new metrics to measure, new business models to utilize, and new institutions to govern. Today, it's happening again. Solar, wind, and batteries won't just displace fossil fuels, they will create an entirely new energy system. Autonomous electric vehicles won't just displace combustion engines, they will create an entirely new transportation system. Precision fermentation and cellular ag agriculture won't just replace animal agriculture, they will create an entire new food system. And humanoid robots won't just displace human robots or human jobs, instead they will create an entirely new and vastly larger and more capable labor system. Everything now, all whilst at once. there are a lot of negatives to this guys, some of the positives will be an enormous increase in GDP, in production. Um, actual production worldwide will skyrocket. We're looking at increases of, you know, China's trying to grow at five, six, seven percent. We're looking at potential increases of 20, 30, 40 percent per year. Now, Siba didn't say that, by the way, just so you know. This is what I think will happen. It is impossible to know in advance to see the full details of how the new labor system will differ from today. But the key feature is the marginal cost of labor will rapidly approach zero. Now, this is why I originally called this channel the Electric Singularity, because I believe the singularity will occur and we'll see an enormous creation of wealth worldwide. This will lead to the complete eradication of poverty. And there's a lot of people who believe this is insane and I'm just being an optimist, but I believe poverty will be completely eradicated. And our standard of living for all 7 billion people on the earth will within a probably less than a decade increase to the point of complete today's Western civilization. And I believe that this will all occur within a very short space of time, much like it. So you see, it's this belief when you don't have the Lord, this belief that the world is going to bring about this utopia and everybody will have what? Everything will be available. Everything can be made for cheap. Everybody will have their own robots that can make anything within any process for everything, clothes. I watched one with guys shipping containers for clothes that will manufacture clothes on demand. I mean, it is wild what's happening out there. But do you think man is going to bring about the 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 millennial reign of 
of the Lord's peaceful reign on earth? Of course not. And yet all these things are happening within the next 10 to 15 years. Hello. Did in China, where the entire country was brought out of poverty within only about a decade. Seba says that from this new transformation, many other new system properties and behaviors will follow, just like when the internet and digital technologies reduce the marginal cost of information and communications to near zero. The disruption of labor, he says, is about tasks though, not jobs. History shows that disruptions require new metrics. Incandescent light bulbs used to be sold according to how much power they consumed. Bulbs typically used in homes might be rated 40 watts for use in storage areas, 60 watts for living areas, or 100 watts for large rooms that need lots of illumination. He says that when the first LED light bulbs were introduced to the market, people quickly realized that the old metrics were no longer useful. LEDs consume so much less energy than incandescents that they could not be easily compared to the old bulbs based on their power consumption. Instead, the new bulbs were simply rated according to how much light they emitted in lumens and the color of the light they produced on a scale called color temperature measured in degrees Kelvin. In the case of humanoid robots, the old and misleading metric is jobs. And I, I think it's a little bit like what Jim Rohn says about the perception we have of what we do. We believe that we are paid based on an hourly wage or a salary, but actually we're paid based on value. So this paradigm will change to the perception where everything will be done based on value. Most jobs involve much more than performing a single task, he says. They typically entail responsibility for a range of tasks, each of which requires a different amount of training, experience, and skill to perform. They often come with complex contractual obligations on the part of both employer and employee, and they are deeply intertwined with an individual's career, identity, and even their community and culture. So long as humanoid robots are not sentient, they will not have jobs. They will only perform tasks the disruption of labor with all of its world-changing implications can therefore only be understood with tasks as the correct unit of analysis and tasks per hour per dollar as the corresponding cost capability metric. In the beginning of the disruption, the tasks a robot can perform will be narrow. The hours it can work with its, within its useful operational life before decommissioning will be limited to just a few years worth and their upfront costs will be fairly high but each of these elements of their key cost capability metric will improve rapidly and substantially over the next 10 years. Do you remember the original phones? You know, massive bricks, huge things. Compare them to how expensive they were. They were thousands of dollars, meaning in probably today's money, they were more than fifteen to $20,000. Well, look what we have today. Things changed drastically. As a result of all of these changes, Seba says that all products and services will get cheaper. He says labor is an essential input into every link of every supply chain, of every product, and service across the entire global economy. That means as the cost of labor falls, so will the cost of everything else. This would hold true as humanoid robots are deployed at scale, even if the cost capability of humanoid robots will also be improving at the same time and dramatically as deployment proceeds. This will only amplify and accelerate the dynamic of universal cost reduction. We must expect and plan for a sweeping tide of supply-driven, not demand-driven, deflationary pressure across the entire global economy as a function of the disruption of labor by humanoid robots. Now, what does this mean? Well, everything is going to get better. All products, drastically better. I mean, probably think, oh, smartphones, they're amazing today, but they're nothing compared to what they will be. Cars, airplanes, drones, everything will be much, much better than they are now. You can't even imagine how good things are going to be. The quality of virtually all manufactured goods will tend to improve, he says, because the limits of skill and attention to detail that apply to humans do not apply to robots. Seba says that manufacturers will have far less incentive to cut corners, sacrifice precision, or fail to ensure that tasks and processes are performed with maximum care and thoughtfulness because, in stark contrast to human workers, there will be little to no cost savings obtainable from humanoid robots these ways. Every humanoid robot will perform every task it is capable of performing at the maximum quality it can perform it every single time. As a result of all this, productivity will skyrocket. And this is where my belief of the singularity comes into play. Improvements in technological capability and the accumulation of capital in its various forms, equipment, infrastructure, knowledge, social relationships, have made humanity more and more productive on a per capita basis throughout the ages, and especially since the Industrial Revolution. 
But labor has always remained a limiting factor of production. And up until now, the quantity of available labor has been a function of population. I mean, look at China, right? 1.3, 1.4 billion people and their production and manufacturing capacity is enormous. Regions with more and cheaper labor have enjoyed a competitive advantage as a result. Humanoid robots fundamentally change this equation. Instead of growing only as fast as a human population, available labor can grow as fast as humanoid robots can be built and deployed. The difference is explosive. Sieber says that like a dam busting, humanoid robots will unleash a torrent of productivity as countless tasks that could hitherto only be performed by the finite supply of adult humans are performed far more cheaply by humanoid robots. This will affect not only all existing applications and industries, but also enable entirely new applications and industries which were not previously possible in the old human-based labor system due to the high cost, danger, or other limitations of human workers. And the humanoid robot labor force can expand with little constraint in almost any region or country, negating most of the regional competitive advantage from low-cost labor that we see today. Could this mean that China's huge manufacturing advantages will be wiped out? I don't know, but China does seem concerned about this. They have said that they are massively investing in their local robotics companies to try to get them to help them um, spread their robot workers all around the world. They believe this disruption is coming, but they want to be the ones to make it happen. Investing in humanoid robots is now a matter of national interest, says Sieber. This is important. Humanoid robots will allow any nation to massively expand its workforce and thus grow its economy on a productivity per capita basis to a degree that has simply been physically impossible up until now. And I think that this is what Elon Musk truly understands and is the reason why he is pivoting Tesla away from simply being a car company or a company that produces things into a company that produces uh, workers that can create anything. It takes almost 20 years and more than $100,000 to raise a child and prepare them to join the national workforce of a middle income country. In the wealthier countries where cost of living is higher, the cost can exceed $300,000, not including post-secondary education at university. Humanoid robots, by contrast, can be added to the workforce as fast as they can be manufactured. And it is unlikely their unit cost will exceed that of an inexpensive car, even at the very start of commercial deployment. This means that by 2035, for example, adding 1 million people to a nation's workforce might cost 100 billion and take 20 years. Whereas adding 1 million humanoid robots to its workforce might cost just 10 billion and take a single year. As a civilization, we should be able to build humanoid robots at least at the rate we build automobiles. Uh, in other words, several billion potentially per year. Sieber says we therefore have every reason to expect that physical labor by humanoid robots will supplant physical labor by humans just as quickly as the other examples of the disruption X curves that they've illustrated earlier. For planning and investment purposes, the deployment of humanoid robots is akin to investment in infrastructure, whether public or private infrastructure serves as an enabling condition for other activity. This includes economic productivity, of course, but also quality of life activity ranging from comfort and security to travel and leisure. Nations have historically made enormous investments in basic infrastructure, and we ought to expect this for humanoid robots as well. And just as investments in road and electrical infrastructure recursively enabled their own further deployment, so too will humanoid robots. But here's the thing. This could potentially enable small nations that haven't previously been able to compete a huge possible advantage. The greater a nation's productive capacity is, the greater is its ability to remain economically self-sufficient. In the past, this was only realistic for populations with a large resource base. But a large robotic workforce combined with the disruptions of energy, transportation, and food, even the smaller nations would be able then to become far less dependent upon foreign trade. Whether the option for isolationism would have what well, benefits or detriments to international relations, he says, remains to be seen. But there is some interesting challenges to national security. Today, says Sieber, the size of a nation's army can only be a subset of its population. In the future, nations and non-state actors will be able to raise humanoid robot armies that are larger and more capable than today's largest armies, regardless of their own population size. Could there be that's always a great point to remember too, right? Not only all of these things that are going to change everything for life and it's already begun and everything all at once is going to change, but what about these robots being used for military? Not the slow one like you see here. With every day, it gets better and stronger and all sorts of companies and countries are making them. Do you think that's really going to continue? And it'll just be humanoid robots all over the world and battling one robot against the other nation over nation? I don't think so. 
and the robots are being built right now. So again, how much time could we possibly have left? Huge wars, World War Three. Who knows, it's certainly possible. Any humanoid robot capable of working in a productive capacity can also be deployed in a national security capacity, whether in a supporting or frontline role. And unlike human beings, for, when, for whom military conscription and training and deployment is difficult and costly on every level, humanoid robots can be replaced literally overnight. This means that for better or worse, any nation with a large robotic workforce is also a nation with a large robotic army. Whether this becomes a requisite condition of national defense for sovereign integrity in the 21st century remains to be seen. But the fact that humanoid robots have clear and unequivocal military implications cannot be ignored. Asima says that um, there is no time to lose. America is really already behind the eight ball when it comes to electric cars. They've well and truly lost that race, but they cannot afford to lose this one. Humanoid robots are likely to be one of the most profitable physical product categories ever by virtue of the sheer scale of their production numbers alone. Given the size of the global labor market, together with latent demand that this technology will unlock, it is reasonable to expect the number of humanoid robots deployed to exceed 1 billion over the next two decades, and possibly many, many more. But beyond just their direct financial return to investors, the sweeping implications of the inevitable explosion in productivity, material superabundance, and overall prosperity mean that the returns to society at large on investment in humanoid robots are nothing short of staggering. Governments and other public institutions such as universities therefore have a crucial role to play. CBS says that as a matter of general principle, governments, universities, and other public interest institutions and organizations should be prepared to dedicate enormous resources to funding and supporting the development and deployment of humanoid robots in their societies as a matter of national interest. This is urgent. This includes finding funding and support for basic R&D, manufacturing, infrastructure to support deployment. Rapid development of these capacities will require massive investment in order to procure requisite human expertise, facilities and raw material and energy inputs, as well as every element in each of their associated supply chains. Now, Seba says that humanity has been in this sort of situation before. Many societies have built roads, plumbing for running water, electricity services, telephone service, and broadband internet service to every home and business. These basic services not only bring prosperity, but massively increase productivity as well. Societies must now aim for robots in every home and business, and for exactly the same reasons. A great deal of experimentation and learning will be required to convert investments in humanoid robots into actual real value. Testing zones that resemble factories, hospitals, and even outdoor urban areas where robotics companies can engage in high learning rate, low risk to humans experimentation are needed urgently, just as test tracks were for autonomous vehicles. Incentive programs of all kinds should be trialed to encourage adoption of the technology and experimentation at every level. Seba says that as the capabilities of humanoid robots approach and then exceed those of human workers, the future will belong to these societies that embrace the humanoid robot labor disruption, developing and deploying this technology as rapidly as possible. Now, how, do these, how does this disruption of human labor affect other areas? Well, Seba says that it will disrupt energy transportation in food in paradigm changing ways. Research shows that disruptions are already underway in energy transportation and food, each of which is a foundational sector of the global economy Adding the disruption of labor by humanoid robots to the mix will be like hosing gasoline on an already roaring inferno by making all goods and services cheaper, higher quality, and generally expanding productivity at large. Humanoid robots will only accelerate the deployment of each of the constituent technologies behind the other three foundational disruptions as well. Solar power, wind power, and batteries in the energy sector, electric autonomous vehicles in the transportation sector, and precision fermentation and cellular agriculture in the food sector. So what does this mean for human beings for us? Well, Seba says that humanoid robotics will massively increase prosperity and thereby make every major social, economic, geopolitical and environmental problem much more solvable. This is an optimistic viewpoint and I agree with him. Industrialized countries are undergoing massive demographic changes. Every retirement party packs a double whammy as it means not only one less member of the national workforce, but also one person collecting a pension or one more person, I should say, collecting a pension. Countries are seeing rapidly aging populations, declining labor forces, and in some cases, a falling population. In response, governments are trying to stake baby booms in their own populations and trying to attract skilled immigrants from other countries. Meanwhile, climate change threatens to destabilize communities and regions across the globe by shifting rainfall patterns, inundating coastlines, exacerbating storm and flood risks, and altering the suitability of land for agriculture, among many other impacts. 
Formidable challenges abound, from housing shortages and rising demand, to medical services, to water and resource shortages, to civil strife, and even war. Problems, whether natural or human-made, are inevitable and they're unavoidable. The key to overcoming them is, and always has been, prosperity. Indeed, a useful way to define prosperity itself is as problem-solving capacity. The disruption of labor, especially in combination with the disruption of energy, transportation, and food, has the potential to vastly expand material abundance worldwide, and thus greatly increase prosperity for everyone, everywhere. If the rate of cost capability improvement in humanoid robots continues as it has been, we will enter an era of material superabundance and prosperity over the next 10 to 20 years that has hitherto been all but unimaginable outside of science fiction. But as the technologies of AI and robotics, along with solar panels and self-driving cars and impossible burgers all move from the realm of science fiction to science fact, so too do their profound implications. The technology convergence of the humanoid robot labor engine is happening now. Manufacturability is critical to SIBA. Every element of robotics hardware and software is likely to improve dramatically over the next decade. But one specific aspect of hardware design that deserves special emphasis is manufacturability, says SIBA. Much of the value as well as competitive advantage of humanoid robots from the very start will be in the deployment at scale. Even if their capability is limited at first, this can be continuously upgraded with over-the-air updates as their AI rapidly improves, which means there is no reason to delay adoption. It is now a high stakes global race to build and deploy robots as quickly as possible among not only competitors within any given industry, but also between industries and between nations as well. Now, intriguingly, Siva says that the humanoid form factor, in other words, what we look like, will dominate robotics applications for at least the next decade. Although specialization and optimization of robotics unconstrained by the human form will eventually make sense, the robots developed and deployed during the first phase of the disruption will take humanoid form. All the existing facilities, equipment, and infrastructure is designed around the human form. That makes the humanoid form a natural choice for a mass-produced robot in the near term. In the early stages, says, says Siba, of the disruption, the capability of AI driving the robots will still be immature. In order to improve, enormous amounts of training data must therefore be gathered for AI training. The humanoid form is a clear choice for facilitating large-scale data gathering because humans themselves can facilitate the collection of the data. This data could take the form of video recorded of humans doing tasks, humans teleoperating human robots, humans wearing sensor suites, and so on. All within human-centric environments using human-centric tools. And we saw in Tesla's latest video with their bot, the person, the engineer in the video was showing the robot what to do, and the robot was actually copying the human. So this is what Steve is saying is how it will, go, will happen at the start. Siva says that autocatalysis of humanoid robot production will be key to the success of both individual firms and even national economies. The advantages of humanoid robots are so stark at every level of analysis, from individual firms to industries to regions and entire nations, that it is obvious we are now under race conditions to deploy humanoid robots as fast as possible, as discussed above. It is also obvious that rapid deployment requires huge investments in R&D, manufacturing capacity, and infrastructure to support that deployment. What is less obvious is that humanoid robots must be deployed as early as possible into their own manufacturing to accelerate their production and deployment flywheel. We've seen this before. Computer hardware and software has always been used to design better computer hardware and better software. So <laughs> Develop the computers, build them faster and, and as good as possible so that we can put the computers in the development program to build themselves even better and faster. <laughs> Crazy. Off acceleration will thus need to be a crucial part of humanoid robot investment and deployment strategy at every level, from an individual firm's business model to an entire nation's policymaking. So how does this affect you and your job, our jobs? Well, this is an interesting one. And Siebert says this, technological unemployment remains inevitable, but latent demand for labor will be met first, creating a crucial planning window for a soft landing. In other words, he's warning you, it's going to happen, prepare for it. The demand for labor vastly exceeds the available supply. There are chronic labor shortages across a wide range of industries in many countries, including throughout Europe and the United States. And beyond demand for labor in the form of existing job roles, there is also an enormous quantity of latent demand for labor that goes perpetually unmet because it is too low paying, too dangerous, or otherwise too undesirable for human workers to supply at all. Moreover, history shows that although capital in the form of facilities, machinery, and knowledge have, some, have substituted and thus displaced labor time and time again, labor has nevertheless evolved to remain complementary to that capital. 
Counterintuitively, this has put upward pressure on the value of labor over time. This dynamic is sometimes framed as technological empowerment of labor, when new technologies increase worker leverage by expanding their capabilities. For example, construction workers have been literally empowered by power tools, while office workers have been figuratively empowered by computers and other information technology. Following this historical pattern, there will be a brief period when the same is also true of humanoid robots. In the near term, perhaps a decade or so, humanoid robots will be largely deployed to meet demand for labor that is currently going unmet by humans, as opposed to directly displacing human workers from jobs they currently occupy. This will create a non-obvious and counterintuitive situation in which humanoid robots appear to be almost purely a force multiplier for existing jobs and workers, rather than a threat to them. Like we work alongside them and everything goes nicely, but it won't end that way. While true and worthy of celebration, we must be aware this condition will not persist for long. Even though an individual human's capability will be greatly enhanced if they have a personal team of humanoid robots to command, there will be no benefit to employers of having that human in the loop instead of merely commanding that team of robots directly themselves, possibly using some sort of computer program, especially with executive assistance from increasingly capable artificial intelligence. One person could essentially run an entire billion dollar company. This means the era of complementarity between labor and capital is coming to a close. Work will soon become something that only machines do. When the disruption of its labor of labor is complete, we will need to rethink economics because fundamental notions like scarcity and exogenous total factor productivity will no longer hold. The labor engine itself, a new kind of capital, will become self-sustaining and self-expanding and superabundance will become the rule rather than the exception. It is almost impossible to overstate how radical this transformation of the human condition will be. It will indeed be liberating to an extent that up until now has seemed almost unimaginable, purely the realm of utopian science fiction. But it also means widespread public concern about technological unemployment from AI and robotics remains entirely valid in the longer term, from perhaps the late 2030s onward. And this has me thinking, could it be something like the movie WALL-E, you know, the animated film WALL-E, where Human beings eventually um, lose the ability to even really move around because we can become kind of like um, blobs that are just sitting being entertained all the time. Well, for some people, that will happen. Seba even says that the, the destabilization caused by the disruption of labor could well be catastrophic. And he says that we must use this fleeting grace period that we have now to prepare for a soft landing, meaning a stable and just transformation across society in response to the disruption of labor. Demand for labor, he says, is so great and varied that many different firms will thrive simultaneously in the early years of the disruption. Like light bulbs, telephones, computers, and many other disruptive technologies, the demand for humanoid robots will be enormous. At the beginning of the disruption, when demand still vastly exceeds supply, no single producer will be able to capture all markets. We should therefore expect to see the same pattern that has emerged in previous disruptions. Many companies, both startups and incumbents, will rapidly develop humanoid robot offerings for wide range applications, targeting dozens or hundreds of market niches using a variety of different business models. Even though the leading technology developers in the humanoid robot sector might limit their humanoid robots to deployment in factories or to lease only user agreements, there will be so much demand for humanoid robots that other firms lower on the leaderboard will still enjoy huge opportunities to step in and target other markets with other business models as well. For example, if a leading firm decides to only lease its robots for use in factories, one or more other firms will seize the opportunity to sell robots for use at home, even if their robots are somewhat less capable. Now, Siebert concludes by saying that in other disruptions throughout history, we have seen incumbent interests turn to their governments for protection against new technologies. These protections can take the form of subsidies and handouts to the old industries, regulations and prohibitions that impede new industries built upon the new technologies and bailouts when the old industry inevitably collapses. Almost invariably, the benefits of these protections accrue only to the privileged few who own and control the incumbent interests, rather than to individuals and communities who lose their livelihoods because of the disruption. Now, this could happen. It could be catastrophic. But to avoid making the same mistakes as SIBA, which could prove catastrophic at the scale of an entire global labor market, we must rethink the relationships between a nation's population and its economic output and get ready to transform society itself. The disruption of labor is inevitable, and together with the disruptions of energy, transportation, and food, it could herald a new age of unprecedented freedom and unprecedented prosperity. But only if we are willing to experiment, to learn, and to transcend the limits of the past, starting 
right now. All right. So that it's probably, I don't know if I've ever shown a video of that length before in its fullness, because this, this was just so important. Everything is within this, you know, and like I said, it's not, you know, I show it so that you guys, if you want, you can go dig into these things and look further, but is there really a need to, well, if you want to, but you don't really need to, because what you're going to see, and as this continues to, as we continue to go through this tonight. I believe what we're seeing is an incredible confirmation of the season and time that we are historically globally in and not just as a ministry watching and praying, although that is the key, but by stepping out a little bit and, and going into the depths of what's really going on behind the scenes around the world, what's really taking place, man. It doesn't get any more clear. You go watch this video and some of the other ones where where, where uh, Tom Seba is talking and he shows these S charts and everything. I'm telling you, it is already started for them. Listen to this. When you, he didn't talk here in this one in relation to, you know, the car prices and so forth. But if you go watch this one, he talks about it. He spoke first about how solar back in 2014, he wrote an article or, or 20, 2011, he wrote an article in May of 2011 that solar, as I said earlier, would drop 80 to 90 percent within the next decade. Everybody laughed and scoffed at him. What happened? It dropped 82 percent. When Tesla's and electric vehicles started coming out, they were 80, 90,000. He said within the next 10 years, there'll be about 11,000, 12,000. I think he even said like 11,400. And when we look at, and we pay attention to what was just said in the last video, in this one, we see that um, that the U.S. is far behind other competitors in relation to the electric car. And that's really because of China. They're really behind China in all of this. So when we hear a, a Tesla car at 25, 26,000 coming out, people are like, oh, that's great. Well, they would be paying more than double too much. Check this out. And this is this is going to start with him talking solar because we were talking solar and how those prices came down. Then we're going to go into a video about the car prices and showing those car prices came down. These are all things that people laughed and scoffed and said there's no way within a 10-year period that these things are going to drop 80 to 90 percent. Over and over and over again. How did Tony how did Tony Skiba know this? because of S-curves, tracking S-curves throughout history. Here's a short. Your power, um, the, like we talked about solar power for cars. The issue is that cars just have a very low surface area. You could actually power the entire United States with 100 miles by 100 miles of solar. Really? Yes. So you can just pick some dead spot that you fly which, over. Which they have plenty. Cover that sucker up Correct. with solar panels and charge the whole country. Absolutely. 24 seven. We need batteries, but yes. Wow. Yeah, it's not hard. I mean, meaning it's like it's very feasible. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, the sun is converting over four million tons of mass to energy every second, and it's no maintenance. That thing just works. We have a giant fusion reactor in the sky. <clears throat> so you see, a hundred by a hundred square, somewhere in America, could power the entire United States. This is what I was telling you. They, they did, they're doing this in Norway with wind power. And they're only going to increase it. And then they get everybody to get to get uh, EVs because they can power from their own grid of renewable energy. It's not make believe. It really, really is happening. And my excitement isn't in the fact that these things are happening for the sake of happening because I don't care whether I have an EV or not. These th I'm not concerned about these things. It's the fact that it's happening. And it is following the S-curve of time for emerging technologies of this sort. And now all of it is happening at once. And one of the key factors of it all is ChatGPT. When it opened to the public, that was like setting a little timer. Now listen to this. 
Tesla's Tesla CEO Elon Musk says he opposes EV tax incentives. Tariffs on Chinese EVs. Why would he say such a thing? Let's go through it. Rob, is this a video? Yes. Go ahead and play this clip. Go for it. In favor of, of no tariffs. Um, I'm also actually in favor of no um, uh, tax incentives uh, for EVs, but, but provided that there are also the tax incentives for oil and gas must also be eliminated. So I'm in favor of, of no tariffs and no incentives for electric vehicles or for oil and gas. And if, if they're all taken away, I think that would be for, for the best. So it's back to what you were saying about truth. You want the truth uh, of yeah, the price? I think, I think generally th things that uh, inhibit um, freedom of exchange uh, or distort the market are um, not good. Okay, you're, you're saying that, right? Now keep this in mind. Tom, while he's saying this, talking about the EV market, just 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, you know what America's tariff was on anybody trying to sell cars in U.S.? So think about BMW Germany. Think about Toyota Japan. Think about China trying to sell a car here, right? Okay. What do you think the tariff was? Do you know the number? What, year? Just, what year? Ten years ago. Pre-Trump. I don't pre -Trump. think it was a tariff. There is a tariff, huh, but what do you think the number was? Very minimal. Give me the number. Five percent. Two and a half percent. Yeah, I went crazy. Trump took it from two and a half percent on China to what? Twenty-five percent. I said twenty-three. <laughs> do you know what Biden just did? What? Can you pull this up, Rob? But Biden, China, tariffs, 100%, okay? Mm. So Biden just did this. 100? A 100% hundred tariff. That, that's two weeks ago. A 100% tariff rate on EVs will protect American manufacturers from China's unfair trade practices. This action advances President Biden's vision of ensuring the future of the auto industry will be made in America by American workers. So check mm. this out. He makes this 100% tariff. Four X is what Trump did. Wow. Now, why would he do this? Have you, have you guys heard of BYD? Have you heard about the BYD cars? The Seagull. Okay, Rob, go to BYD. So this is China's BYD car, okay? If you go to BYD, this is their car. Okay, go to, this is what they build, okay? Rob, can you go to cheapest BYD car price? Cheapest BYD car price. Look at this, $9,700. What? Yes. The it's, Seagull. <laughs> it's starting price is Starting price, $9,700. What were they 10 or so years ago? First Tesla's come out. They were eighty, ninety thousand dollars ninety percent price drop, eighty five percent price drop. They're ninety seven hundred US for these base starter ones out of China. This is why he increased the price from twenty five percent to a hundred percent. So even at a hundred percent, it's like a twenty thousand dollar car still cheaper than a Tesla. Now the Tesla will have more features, so people would probably still want to pay that extra. But those who can't? But the fact is, not about buying the car. It follows the S curve or the X curve, right? Prices up here and prices come down. Adoption is slow and then adoption becomes high. It's this S curve, X curve that happens and it's happening in everything all at once because the energy, the battery quality, the, the price to, to, to do it, the, the ability for, for energy to, to source these things, to, to power these things as solar will get built more and all of these things, it's all happening, guys. Let me go to this other portion I had. Let's see what he says here. nothing more powerful than you making your thing happen really going for what you this next chart may give you the chills because this is probably the most scariest chart out of, out of all of them that the next one that he's going to pull up go ahead and pull it up check this out zoom in this is from 2010 to 2024 china cars are heading mostly to new drivers in emerging markets look at this Whoa. 2010 china's last place 11 last place 12 last place last place last place 2020 they pass up us and we're declining they pass up South Korea. Then they pass up Germany. They just passed up Japan. Oof. China's officially number one. In how many years from last to first? In less than four years. Look at it. Yeah, look at 2019. From 21 in three years. They went from last to first place. Simply because of their EVs. And by the way, the CEO of this. Crazy. It's incredible, guys. <laughs> we are here. The curve is happening. Now, here's another piece. This is only a 35 a 34 minute clip. It's a news clip because again, depending if you watch this video, it's talking about the the next generation. 
they're, they're not interested in driving. People, because of this technology and because of AI, they won't even be driving. He goes on in the, in the video to the Saudis, in the, in the talk to the Saudis, to say that it would be more expensive even as more and more get away from fossil fuel for their cars and the price for fossil fuel has to drop even if it's a quarter cents, I mean, a, a, a 25 cents a gallon, it would still be more expensive to operate your car as a daily driver with a combustion engine than just to pay a subscription service to these big corporations like whoever it might be, like say maybe Uber won't have drivers anymore. That's what's coming. Uber won't have drivers and people would just pay a monthly subscription and whenever you wanted one, or you planned, or you called, boom, it comes up, and there's no driver. Elon is launching RoboTaxi on August 8th, 2024. And when you watch to see that they're already starting it in China, they're already running it with some of their brands, it's already happening. How is this possible? It's the S-curve at the speed of everything is going. To prove these are these little clips that I'm showing you are to prove these things that were already spoken about that are literally happening. That went from obscurity three or four years ago to all happening, all parts of the world, all at the same time. Breaking news on Tesla, Phil LeBeau, what's going on? John, we have a date for the unveil of the robo-taxi. Yes, Elon Musk says there will be a robo-taxi, and he plans to unveil it on August 8th. He just put that out on X. That's all he said. Did not say anything about when. August 8th. <laughs> really close to the time uh, we're all looking forward to, right? So again, just to make the point, self-driving cars to pick you up and drive you everywhere? Now, is it going to be in every city and every town right away? No. But it will progress, and it progresses, and it progresses. Why? Because of these S-curves that are showing everything now all at once. But these guys are the optimists. Let's see what else can take place. Let's see why there, there's a need to, to have slowed these things down. Because it's not... It, just because they're excited for it doesn't mean that this universal basic income that would come along the way, and by the end we would all be in utopia like the millennial reign, but brought about by man, is going to be like that. It never is with fallen man. Listen to this clip. You know, I think AI will probably... like. Now, this is Sam Altman. For those of you guys who don't know, Sam Altman is the, is the guy with with uh, uh, Elon Musk, who started OpenAI, oh, Elon Musk separated because OpenAI, they then let it loose. He, they didn't, he, Elon wasn't on the side of really letting it loose and wanted it to be open, and they closed it because they wanted funding. But this guy goes into it because of some very interesting wording. You know, I think AI will probably, like most likely sort of lead to the end of the world. People like Altman benefit <laughs> from the narrative that AI is this big scary thing, even as they're the ones trying to build and profit from it. Here's Tim O'Reilly again. It, it feels a little bit like a kind of misdirection. They're basically calling for a kind of regulation of an extreme risk to avoid the regulation of the many proximate harms we can see today. If they were really afraid of it, they would stop doing their research. Instead, they're racing uh, to accelerate it so they can get a monopoly. It's a lot like uh, the, the famous lion from The Wizard of Oz. They pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And a lot of what I have spent my time in talking about AI regulation is this. There is a man behind the curtain or a series of men who are making decisions for their business advantage. And those are the things that we need to be regulating. Why are they moving fast to break things? I mean, in the Altman clip from before, where he says the world ending thing, he literally says this right after. You know, I think AI will probably, like most likely sort of lead to the end of the world. But in the meantime, uh, there will be great companies created with serious machine learning. Companies, see, it's right back to profit. But hold on, isn't OpenAI a nonprofit? Not anymore. Not anymore. But did you hear what he said with Sam Altman? 
yeah, it'll probably bring about the end of the world at some point with AI. But until then, there will be many great companies built. Those that will still lead the charge. The, 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 the coming universal basic income. The timing of all of it and the portion of time of that universal basic income is directly in line with the timing of the mark of the beast in the revelation of the end of days. Now let's listen to what he said about timing here. Listen to this. And then we're almost done through these things. This was an amazing track, 100%. Yeah. And we're just at the start of this exponential curve. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's really the third inevitable. So the third inevitable is not RoboCop coming back from the future to kill us. We're far away from that, right? Third inevitable is what does life look like when you no longer need Drake? Well, you've kind of hazarded a guess, haven't when you? you? I mean, Drake I was anymore. listening to your audio book last night and at the start of it, you frame various outcomes. One of the, in both situations, we're on the beach, on an island. <laughs> exactly, yes. yes. I don't know how I wrote that, honestly. I mean, but that's, I, so I'm reading the book again now because I'm updating it, as you can imagine, with all of the, uh, of the, uh, of the new stuff. But, but it is really shocking, huh? the idea of you and I inevitably are going to be somewhere in the middle of nowhere in, you know, in 10 years time. I, I used to say 2055, I'm thinking 2037 is a very pivotal. I used to think 2055. Now I think more like 2037. So what he was talking about was he used to think it might be, you know, 20, 25 or so years down the road, you know, maybe 30. What does he say now? 2037, right? The end of 13 years. Back when he said this, it would have been 14 years, okay? Because he said it last year. But what does he say about what it is? With the moment now, uh, you know, and, and, and we will not know if we're there hiding from the machines, we don't know that yet. There is a likelihood that we'll be hiding from the machines and there is a likelihood we'll be there because they don't need podcasters anymore. Oh, and... Excuse me. <laughs> He's toying with them, of course. So again, because there won't be the need of the human workforce or of humans, what would be the point if they're all just gonna be lying around being blobs and some doing creative things and things like this if there's now a few billion robots doing everything? Within fifth years because it has already begun everybody that I've shown is an expert in their field and involved in this and in the research involved in the AIs they all have the same time frame and this is the only thing where what they thought might take longer and we just need to push it further out they're all bringing it in because the exponential S-curve of this is no longer like a, a long, drawn-out process. It goes like this. Because it learns and learns from itself and then relearns and learns from itself and teaches the other ones to do it. Check this out. This is something freaky. I've seen, I've seen this before, but I don't know if I've spoken on this. This is uh, the two guys that are in this. These guys go around, like I said earlier, and they speak at conferences for world leaders, you know, different Congress to, to business techs, to, to Saudis. I mean, they go all over the world talking about what is taking place. And they're on the side of, we need to slow this down. You see, just like what the last guy showed with the, with ta or the second last one in talking with Sam Altman is... You know, they, they want to speed. They, they know there's, there's things of concern. It, it could go about this way. But if we don't do it, then, oh, China and others will take over. If we don't do well, it's too late now. You know, we got to keep going. So it, it, it's almost like there needed to be this progression and, and this insight to slow it down and consider what's happening. This is how wild it is. This is what the AI looks at. So this is a, a, a picture of a human looking at a picture of a giraffe, okay? The AI does not see the picture of the giraffe. The AI is looking at the brain waves and reading the brain waves 
in a person looking at the image of a giraffe. And by reading the brain waves, look what AI can figure out. See the original image, and it's asked to reconstruct what it sees. Right? So the AI didn't do it because it saw the picture. It's based on what the brain waves were doing. It was able to reproduce the picture. <laughs> do you understand what's happening? And it's happening in every sector around the world all at once. The B system, right? They stuck them into an fMRI machine and they showed them images. And they taught the AI, I want you to translate from how blood is moving around in your brain. First, so this means certainly in the next couple of years we'll be able to start decoding dreams. Um, okay, so it can like see, reconstruct what you're seeing, but can it reconstruct your, say, what you're thinking, your inner monologue? Um, so here they did roughly, this, it's a different lab, but roughly the same idea. They had people watch these videos and would try to reconstruct their inner monologue. Um, so here's the video, it's this woman getting hit in the back. <laughs> knock forward okay and then what would the AI reconstruct I see a girl that looks just like me get hit on the back and then she's knocked off so just to really name something really quickly, brain waves. Um, the point about differentiating between Siri or I do voice transcription and then it kind of fails and AI seems to like it's not really always growing or working and like we shouldn't be really that scared about AI because it always has these problems right and we've always been promised oh AI is gonna take off it's gonna do all these things what the point of this is, I hope you're seeing that when you're just translating between different languages and everyone's now working on one system, that the scaling factor and the growth is changing in a very different way. So we swapped the engine out of what's underneath the paradigm of AI, but we don't talk about it in a different way because we still have this word we call AI, when the engine underneath what is representing that has changed. Also really important to note here, you know, go back to that first law of technology, you invent a technology, you uncover a new responsibility. We don't have any laws or ways of talking about the right to what you're thinking about. We haven't needed to protect that before. So here's one other example. Um, another language you could think about is Wi-Fi radio signals. So in this room right now, there's a bunch of radio signals that are echoing about, and that's a kind of language that's being spit out, right? And um, there's also another language that we could put a camera in this room, and we can see that there's people. And there's some algorithms already for like, looking at the people and the positions that they're in. So imagine you hook up to an AI, sort of just like you have two eyeballs, and you can have, you sort of do stereoscopic vision between the two eyeballs. You have one eyeball looking at the images of where everybody's at in this room, how many people are here, what posture are they in. And you have another eyeball plugged into the AI that's looking at the radio signals of the Wi-Fi. And they basically said, could we have it train a bunch looking at both and counting the number of people, the postures that they're in, and then we close the eyeball to the AI that's looking at the image. So now we just have the radio signals. And just having Wi-Fi radio signals, you can actually identify the positions and the number of the people that are in the room, right? So essentially, <laughs> there's already deployed the hardware for cameras that can track living beings in complete darkness, also through walls, and it's already out in the world. In fact, it's everywhere that human beings go. <laughs> you see, again, this would relate to end of days, right? When we think about this, how, how will those fleeing into the wilderness how will the lord protect over these drones and infrared let alone this stuff being able to see through walls and to do all these things with the technology that's already out there and what ai is developing to be even better at everything is connected everything is connected to this time let's let's not go into the rest of that section there i think you guys are really getting the picture <laughs> But let's uh, let's bring in a couple more minutes of some of these other parts. Into the combinatorial properties, the compounding properties of these models, you're like, okay, OpenAI released a couple months ago um, something called Whisper, which does sort of state-of-the-art, um, much faster than real-time transcription. This is just speech to text. Yeah. And I just I have a, a good AI system for doing speech to text. Uh, you're like, why, why would they have done that? And you're like, oh yeah, well, if you're running out of internet data, you've already scraped all of the internet, how do you get more text data? Well, I know. Well, there's YouTube and podcasts and radio, and if I could turn all of that into text data, I'd have a much bigger training set. So that's exactly what they did. Um, so See. all of that turns into more data, more data makes your thing stronger, and so we're back in another one of these double exponential kinds of moments. Where this all lands, right, to like put into context, is that nukes don't make stronger nukes, but AI makes stronger AI. It's like an arms race to strengthen every other arms race. Because whatever other arms race between people making bioweapons or people making terrorism or people making DNA stuff, AI makes better abilities to do all of those things. So it's an exponential on top of an exponential. 
if you were to turn this into um, a children's parable, um, we'll have to update all of the children's books. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. But teach an AI to fish and it'll teach itself biology, chemistry, oceanography, <laughs> evolutionary theory, and then fish all the fish to extinction. <laughs> I just want to name, like, this is a really hard thing to hold in your head, um, like how fast these exponentials are. And we're not immune to this. And in fact, even AI experts who are most familiar with exponential curves are still poor at predicting progress, even though they have that cognitive bias. So here's an example. Um, in 2021, a set of like professional forecasters very well familiar with uh, exponentials were asked to make a set of predictions, and there was a $30,000 pot for making the best predictions. And one of the questions was, when will AI be able to solve competition-level mathematics with greater than 80% accuracy? This is the kind of example of the questions um, that are in this test set. So the prediction from the experts was AI will reach 52% accuracy in four years. But in reality, that took less than one year to reach greater than 50% accuracy. And these are the experts. These are the people that are seeing the examples of the double exponential curves, and they're the ones predicting, and it's still four times closer than what they were imagining. Yeah, they're off by a factor of four, and it looks like it's going to reach expert level probably 100% of these tests this year. See that? This, this is the stuff that we're talking about. It's the speed. So even though it looks like it's not happening in so much in so many areas of our lives, it is happening. It is happening, and sometimes because we don't really see it, we're not really into it, it's not really affecting us really yet, it's happening. And in 15 years from now, the progress and the implications and the things that will have taken place within that period of time will make the entirety of, human, of humanity black and white compared to what it is now. Not even recognizable. So what do you think? What do you think this is telling us? This is exciting. Let me bring it to one last piece in this. Because these guys, I mean, these guys really, really know their stuff. They, like I said, they, they too are doing this all over the world. So let me make a point with what they're saying here. We'll finish their portion with this. And the pace that Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, described that he and his colleagues are, are moving at, at deploying AI, is frantic. I and mean, we talk to people in AI safety, the reason, again, that we are here, the reason we are in front of you is because the people who work in this space feel that this is not being done in a safe way. So I really actually mean this. This is extremely difficult material. And I, just for a moment, just, just take a genuine breath like right now. You know, it's, there's this challenge when communicating about this, which is that um, I don't want to dump bad news on the world. I don't want to be um, talking about the darkest horror shows of, of, of the world. But the problem is if it's, it's kind of a civilizational rite of passage moment where if you do not go in to see the space that's opened up by this new class of technology, we're not going to be able to avoid the dark sides that we don't want to happen. And speaking as people who, with the social media problem, we're trying to warn ahead of time, before it got entangled with our society, before it took over children's identity development, before it became intertwined with politics and elections, before it got intertwined with GDP, so you can't now get one of these companies out without basically hitting the global economy by a major, major uh, impact. I get that this seems impossible. And our job is to still try to do everything that we can. Because we have not... F okay. And this is what we're talking about. We're not trying to do everything we can in that sense. We know what our job is to reach the people, right? to reach the people for the Lord, to, to help in salvation for people, to, to bring them to salvation, to lead them in salvation, I guess I should say, and to what? Prepare them. To prepare them, sharing what we've understood, sharing the revelation. I believe we are here. I've said it before recently, and I'll continue to say it. I absolutely believe we're here. And the deeper I've gone into all of these things recently, the more and more and more I believe it, with certainty to the best of my absolute ability. But as I've said before, I don't have a thus saith the Lord. I have never had one, but we do have the revelation of scripture. So I'm going to bring it in with one more video before we then go in to the scripture to be able to give us the strength and bring us back from this, from this, what looks maybe to some of the world is exciting. And I can't believe this is happening or to the other side. That's like, man, this is going to bring about destruction. All of them saying within about a 15-year period, 
and a whole group of the rest of the world in between at some level or the other. And we're saying this is awesome, not because of what it is, not because of what it will do, but because of what it is confirming to us. Can you believe for a moment that man is going to bring this about and bring about this millennial reign of peace? Or do you think it's actually going to be the Lord? It's going to be the Lord, which means this is going to have to be stopped and, and something take place through, throughout this period that will have some of it, but that period of time won't be the period of time that these people are considering. It will be the literal end of days. And in fact, you know, it reminds me of what I shared with you guys. In fact, I might have posted it in the forum. It reminds me of 2 Baruch, right? This part in 2 Baruch where it's talking about the end and what it will be like. It said, for these parts of that time are reserved and will be mixed one with another, and they will minister to each other. This is what I was saying. Seals will be starting and stopping, and the trumpets will have their portion, and some will start, some will stop, some will overlap. For some of these parts will withhold a portion of themselves while taking from others, and some will accomplish their portion as well as that of others. Hence, those who live on the earth in those days will not understand that this is the end of times. Hello. Why wouldn't they think that? Because of exactly what I'm showing you here tonight. What we just went through. They're going to be caught up in seeing all these things. They're not going to realize that these other events and other major things taking place around the world are actually related to the end of days. The majority won't find their way. We know that. There, there will be the greatest revival in all of human history and over a billion people in the great multitude rapture, which will include majority still alive, but some having died as well. But for most, they won't even realize they're in the end of days. They'll think they're in this period of this, of this acceleration of AI. But at that time, <clears throat> whomsoever, whoever understands will be wise. For the measure and the calculation of that time is two parts a week of seven weeks. So out of seven weeks of years, there are two of them, 14 years. Hello. We've covered that before, right? <clears throat> so now listen to this. Donald Trump Jr. We're going to listen to a few seconds of this. This was all about, you know, after Trump, <coughs> excuse me, and the verdict came about. And I went and listened to this all. And some very interesting things were said because they want to stop him at any cost. Will it be another somebody FK, JF, you know? Are they going to go down that route? They want to stop him at any cost. So it might be that route or listen to this. They're even talking about what they the, the left would be willing to bring about because they will not let him get in power again. Now he knows how things work. But what do we know? It won't even get to that point. And so what is he saying here? He's about to say exactly what we know through the revelation of prophecy, why it won't get to that point. Listen to this. Guy that was a, a former like weirdo actor to send the U.S. made missiles into Russia, provoking that, I guess. And maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's the next distraction, right? You know, COVID was the distraction for 2020 to allow them to manipulate things. Maybe World War III is the distraction, you know, for this election. Some cycle. of us called this a year ago. Yeah, the, the but, senile but, like, man can't win. They're going to bring us it, to war. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, no, I, I, I don't say that lightly, but I, I also don't, don't say it like. I don't know, like, would, would I be at all surprised? Not even, I think it's lunacy. I think it's crazy, but do I think they would do it? 100%. Hmm, pretty interesting, right? Put all of these things together now. Consider the season and time that we're in. Do you guys remember this book that we spoke about a couple, few years ago? The book called The Fourth Turning? I believe it was written in 90, mid 90s, I think 96. And we've shared on it a bit in the past, too. This is a, a PDF of it. Listen to this. 
this I can't remember what chapter it's in or what page, but listen to this. This is from the book, The Fourth Turning, which was written in the mid-90s. The Fourth Turning is about these different periods of time called the First, Second, Third, and Fourth Turning, and how these guys have gone back throughout the centuries to track these periods of time and, and what their shortest and longest lengths are in between these periods of time. And with every fourth turning, it's a culmination that is way beyond anything that has come before it. And that with every fourth one, it's beyond the fourth ones that were before it, with the fourth ones being the biggest in all of history. Okay? They've tracked these things, and listen to the time frames they've given us. The crisis era will most likely extend roughly from the middle of the OOs, that's a period of time, to the middle 2020s. They wrote this in mid-90s, remember. Its climax will not like, uh, is not likely to occur before 2005 or later than 2025. Given that the 32 and 52 years are the shortest and longest time spans between any two climax moments in Anglo-American history. War cycle theorists have drawn similar conclusions. Thompson calculates that the average interwar interval period is about 80 years. From this, he concludes, if we look 80 years beyond the end of the last global war, 1945, the, the year... 2025 appears to represent the reasonable projection of histories uh, of the history evidence you see same with this going back hundreds of years and following these cycles the shortest would be in here the longest would be right here they've got it this guy's got it the same uh Morelsky and farah each have targeted the year 2030 as the likely as the next likely epicenter for a general or global war both of them are still not very far away. But is it this? Heck no. We know what we're talking about. It's 2024 that later 2024 going into 2025 would be when it all starts. But it will begin with the attack on Jerusalem at the end of 50 days at the Feast of Trumpets. It says, another scholar of long cycles, Joshua Goldstein at the University of Southern California, agrees that he would put the highest danger of great power war sometime around the decade of the 2020s. These are all from the 90s, guys. 1990s. The dates are suggestive, even if the crisis, even if the crisis need not be as terrible as these images of Armageddon imply. Why? Because when you read through the book, you read that the 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 chaos of a fourth turning and each successive fourth turning over the cycles of centuries is the implication of this one being so drastically changing that it would be like Armageddon. Listen to what it says now. Um, the seculum last quadrant does not specifically require total war, but it does require a major discontinuity discontinuity okay the death of an old order listen to this the death of an old order and a rebirth of something new did were you, were you listening to everything i just went through to a book we've shared on that was written in the mid 90s by following cycles they knew sometime around the mid 2020s there would be a fourth turning that would include most likely a global world war that would be Armageddon-like, but doesn't necessarily have to be. And that within it, as it breaks through, there will have been the death of the old way and a rebirth of something new. Or, yeah, and a rebirth of something new. Everything I showed you tonight is exactly what this was talking about from the 90s do you think these guys were all up on what was going on with ai that ai and it's it's expense it's exponential growth and that its curve turns and goes straight up because it learns and learns from itself and then teaches itself and so on and so forth 
These guys didn't know all of that. And yet the cycles proved it. It's literally happening. A secular winter is indeed an area, an era of trial and suffering, though not necessarily of tragedy. Yeah, it will be this time. Though it can produce destruction, it can also produce uncommon vision, heroism, and the sudden evolution of the human condition. Isn't that what they were just saying? These guys are literally talking about in these chapters here, in these in these uh, paragraphs, what I just showed you tonight from those on the positive side to those on the skeptical warning side. Maybe Armageddon like World War III and a complete new order of everything in some type of old system dying and new system coming, but not necessarily everything bad, but a sudden elevation of the human condition. The exact same thing from a book 30 years ago. Guys, this is exciting. It's scary, but it's also exciting. So now, let me bring you to this video right here. This one will now settle our hearts, strengthen us, and let us know, help us to understand. Have we really understood? Right? Are we really here? Have, have the years revealed understanding? Is all of this happening at this period of time based on the sun, moon, the stars, based on, on the history books, based on books written in the 90s, based on, on all of these scriptures that have been revealed, based on what's going on literally in the world? Is it all pointing to the exact same time that the scriptures are that have been revealed? Well, let's have a listen. This is the guy I was telling you about over videos uh, over the last little while. I might have shared parts of it a few, couple few years ago. This is the guy that was a lawyer. He discovered what was going on with the sun, moon, and stars, and he went and tracked these things, and he started crying, and the Lord started opening up all of this understanding within the events of Scripture to the sun, moon, and stars at the time of Jesus' birth to the time of his death and resurrection. And we're going to tie this in to our chart of the Sabbath year counts, the, the Shemitah counts, and to the, to the Jubilees from where we are now in the revelation of the 14 years and then the final Jubilee. And we're going to track it all the way back by looking at our chart that we have and see if it lines up to what he's been touring for decades now, showing the sun, moon, and stars and what they've told us at the time of Jesus' birth, as well as the time of his death and resurrection. Listen to this. Back of my neck and the back of my arm, and because uh, what follows Jupiter into the sky as we animate the sky. Hit you too. Oops, I don't know why it jumped there. Because this is poetry of terrible beauty. He might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth. Back of my neck and the back of my arm, and. Uh, because what follows Jupiter into the sky as we animate the sky is Virgo, the Virgin. And she is clothed in the sun. And she has the moon at her feet. It's just a crescent moon, a very small crescent, barely invisible moon. There's a reason for that. This is Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. So this is Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, right? This is the Feast of Trumpets. And as he sees this, I want you to know he's in, you might have seen it up in the corner over here, he's in 3 B.C. And at first, you're going to hear him say this, at first he believes that he's found the birth of Christ. But then he pauses. Let's have a listen. The sheer weight of symbolism in the sky on this day, blew me away. In September of 3 BC, when Jupiter is coming in a close conjunction with Regulus, the king planet and the king star, that happening in Leo, the lion representing the nation of Judah, the tribe of Judah, 
That rises in the sky and behind it rises Virgo, the Virgin. And she's clothed in the sun and she has the moon at her feet. It's exactly what John described in Revelation 12. It's what he saw in his vision. It's obvious. That got me. When I went on the time forward and saw that rise and realized, oh my goodness, that's what John saw. There it is. That really let all the hairs come up. So I'm looking at all this stuff happening, you know, and I'm, everything's just you know, really moving me. And I'm thinking, man, if we, this may be the birth of Jesus. And then I thought, wait a minute, maybe not. Because Jewish people and a lot of Christian people believe that uh, life begins at conception. So I thought to myself, well, this might, maybe this is the conception of Jesus. Maybe this is the, the, the Annunciation, when Gabriel appeared to Mary and, and, and she said, be it done unto me. Well, you can test that. I thought, well, let's just wind forward nine months and see if there's... So ponder that for a second. He was just able to show, and he's been teaching this, and he's understood it now, and he proves the birth of Christ, which proves that Jesus' conception is the Feast of Trumpets. Not his birth, his conception. Well, now consider what we talk about in the end of days. We know that 50 days comes first. And when the 50 days end, the 14 years begin what? At Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. Where does the story of the end of days begin? What do we keep teaching? What have we been showing? It begins at that 15th, 16th of Savan in any given year because it was the birth of Christ being the third month. Okay, back then it wasn't in Taurus. Back then it was, uh, was it uh, Aries? I think maybe Aries because the sun was off by one month back then. So when you realize the time Jesus was born would still be June on the Gregorian calendar back then. Okay. So here we are looking at a period of time when the count, when the count of the end of days begins at the birth of Jesus. Remember Genesis chapter one. Remember what we revealed in relation to his birth. In relation to his birth as being the beginning, that the word beginning is the feast of first fruits. And when we take it, understanding that the calendar is off by two months, Savan, the Hebrew third month, is really to the Lord God from the beginning, the first month. And yet, in our daily life now, because the sun is off two months, this third month of Savan is the third month. In the beginning, it was the first month. Where we are now to the time of the end of days, it's the third month. And where was Christ born? In the beginning of the count, in the revelation of the end of days, Jesus is born as in the beginning, his birthday is in Taurus on the 16th day, which is now the third month of on, but in creation, was the first month, 16th day. Which was what? The 15th to the 16th of the first month, which would have been the Feast of First Fruits. But now is the third month. Why do I say this is the beginning of the count in relation to the end of days? Which, by the way, we're June 3rd right now. We're talking what? One, two, two and a half weeks to this point. What does this day begin for us? It begins the seven Sabbaths of the count to the true feast of weeks from as it was in the beginning. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. This was the beginning. And what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths. At the end of seven Sabbaths, bam, pre-trib. And then what do you have? You have the beginning of the 50 days that begins with the seven-day wedding of the Gentile bride. When the seven days are over in that first 50 days, we know at the pre-trib, 
There will also be an attack in northern Israel. It will last for about that week. Who returns? Who's coming on the eighth day? Who's coming on the eighth day after the beginning of the 50 days? The son of man, the white horse rider. He's coming. What day would that be? The 15th, 16th of Av or the 19th, 20th of August, which would be what? Exactly two months after his birthday, which we've revealed and shown and spoken about dozens of times from Isaiah 9 to the Gospel of Luke, to the Gospel of John, to the Gospel of Matthew chapter in Matthew chapter 4. Because what had to happen? There had to be a correction of the two months too late, uh, too fast, that the sun has sped up over the last several thousand years to make up for those 2,000 on the backside to bring everything back into an equilibrium. And it's exactly what? Two months as Jesus fulfilled it from Isaiah 9 to Matthew chapter 4, two months later. It is bang on with the count that begins with the pre-trib and 50 days from the 9th of Av ending on Elul 29, then starting the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets, Jesus' conception. Jesus' conception, Jesus' birth. They're both the beginning of the end of days count. Let's keep going. Check this out. Remember what he said. So he said, well, if, if really it begins at conception, then it should be easy to see if I could find more biblical evidence if maybe I go nine months further. There's anything uh, interesting happening in the sky, so that's what I did. So let's jump forward nine months. Now, we're still reading from Babylon because uh, I don't think they've left yet. <laughs> It's now 2 BC, it's, it's June, it's nine months later. Jupiter has finished crowning Regulus in Leo and is now moving backwards through the constellations like it always does. I'm gonna not the sunset because I need the sky to be darker. And I don't know if you could see this, June 17th, 2 BC. June 17th, 2 BC. You can see it setting in the west, of course, like everything does, because it's the rotation of the earth. Incidentally, if you're in Babylon and you're looking west, what are you looking toward? Israel. Okay, now I'm going to show you something that you can see in any planetarium around the world. Even if they don't believe in Jesus or you know, the Bible or anything, they're going to show you this at Christmas. Because all planetaria do Christmas shows. That's the only way they can get you in there, right? Um, and they always show this event because this event is simply so spectacular. Whether they believe in God or not, they're going to show you this, this shot. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat as I show it to you, though, because the, the, uh, observation back then was all naked eye observation. They had no lenses. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to zoom in because I want to show you guys. I'm going to take you in on the secret of what's happening here. They couldn't zoom, but we can. So I'm going to zoom in way in. Until finally, I get those two objects separated. One of them's Jupiter, the other one's another planet. You're gonna tell me which one, too. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. That's the mother planet. Venus is the mother planet. So we have Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, the mother planet, coming into very close conjunction. That seems kind of pregnant, doesn't it? In fact, they got even closer than that. Let me wind time forward just a little bit. What I'm trying to show you is that they really stacked like a figure eight. So they didn't block each other's light, they added. What you had then was two stars stacked on top of each other, too close together to separate with the naked eye. And so to an observer, it appeared to be the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Um, you, we know the math, and so I can tell you that no one alive had ever seen a star that bright. That was it. I believe the star of Bethlehem was the brightest star. So we've seen the birth of a king in the sky. We've seen the brightest star. So what do you have? The birth of Christ nine months later from the Feast of Trumpets at June 17th, 2 B.C. What's the time of Jesus' birth? 
in our calendar Gregorian time frame now? Right here. Here's where it was back then. Here's where it equals now. Because he was born third month, 15th, 16th day, right? Just like in the beginning. This should be really exciting because we now know this. We've known this for a while. We've talked about these things. We've shared on these things before. But I'm doing this for a purpose so that we can now really dig in knowing that he was born into, into BC. Let's take it now forward a little bit more. Uh, 4750. If you guys want to watch this video, just look down here and, and go watch this for yourselves. It's so awesome. It's absolutely incredible. He shows some wild things. I've seen a clip from another one where he's taken the perspective. Instead of looking from Earth, he goes and places the image from looking at the moon, looking towards Earth. And he shows what is behind Earth. And it's right in the middle of, the, uh, um, of Aries at the death and resurrection of Christ. Right in the heart of Aries is where the Earth is. It's wild. In September of 3 BC, Jupiter crowns Regulus in Leo. Uprises Virgo, clothed in the sun. New moon birthed at her feet, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. Nine months later, the biggest planet goes together with the brightest planet to make the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Where? Right over Jerusalem as it sets. The Magi ride. They get there uh, sometime around November. They go to Herod and they say, we've seen the star, where's the baby king? Uh, Herod says, uh, Bethlehem. So they're leaving uh, the gates of Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem, five mile track. Uh, and they look up and there's the star, there's Jupiter, right over this little town of Bethlehem. One of the guys is the guy who does the math for the group. He's going, wait, 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 wait. It's in full retrograde, it's stopped right over the little town of Bethlehem. They ride down to Bethlehem in 1225, 2 BC. We know that's the date because that's when the star stopped. So what he does is he showed earlier, that's why I say, if you guys want to watch it, you can go watch for yourselves. The Magi had rode at the time of Jesus' birth when they saw that bright star. They get to Bethlehem sometime around, no uh, um, into Jerusalem sometime around November. And how does a star stop? A lot of people said, well, was it a comet? Was it a meteor? Was it this? Was it that? He actually shows it's the retrograde of, uh, what was it, Jupiter, when it comes in a retrograde and then stops and turns and goes back because of the retrograde motion. That stopping date was the date that the Magi got to Jesus. And as you know, in Matthew's gospel in chapter two, Jesus wasn't a little baby at the inn, and at the inn right? Or, or, or at, the, uh, um, uh, um, at the manger. He wasn't there anymore when the Magi got there. It says that he was a toddler, right? He was, he was no longer there, he was at a house. When did they get there? That date when it retrograded and made the turn and stopped before going back and it looked like it was stopping over Bethlehem, it was December 25th of 2 BC. So this is the chronology of what he's talking about from when he saw this and what took place in September. And then nine months later, and the Magi saw that. Then when they saw that birth, the brightest star, then they headed out. And then they tracked this star and then they see this retrograde where it stops and it's right above where Jesus is now dwelling. That's what's taking place. So now let's go a little bit further. 5515. 5515 for a few seconds. Pilate sat because Tacitus, the Roman historian, records it 26 to 36 AD. So all these things taken. So now this is in relation to his death and resurrection. Together, plus more stuff on the website, come to one conclusion. Only April 3 of 33 AD seems to fit all the lines of evidence. This is the day of the cross. Okay, there's the day of the cross. 33 AD, April 3rd. Let's go a little bit further. And then we're just going to see if we've already understood these things to really strengthen this time that we're in, see if we've understood it. The signs didn't stop. When the moon rose that evening, it was a blood moon, a lunar eclipse, which probably scared everybody there to death. 
I mean, I can really honestly think having lived through all of those events and then seeing the blood moon, being scared spitless. When the moon rises, it's already in eclipse. It's a blood moon. Now, I don't know what the Roman soldiers said when they saw that, but don't you know they were freaked out? I mean, seriously. After all these events during the day and then the moon comes up and it's a blood moon, they're probably thinking, oh man, wrong side of this one. But there's more, and I want you to see it all. To show you what else there is, I need to take you back to Scripture. Because I want to get some data from Mark. I'm jumping around in the book, because all I want is, is the time of day. It was the third hour when they crucified him, Mark tells us, and Mark counts from six, so he's telling us he went, he went on the cross at 9 a.m. At the sixth hour, which is noon, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Now, nobody wore wristwatches, but Jesus died at about three. Let's go back to the sky. Now, can you see, if the moon rises in eclipse, that eclipse has to have begun beneath the horizon. If it's already an eclipse, okay. Well, of course, they couldn't look beneath the horizon, but we can. We have software. So I'm not taking it beneath the horizon. It's 2 p.m. Jesus is on the cross, and he's still alive. When I animate the sky, I don't think you're going to be surprised at what you see. As Jesus expires on the cross, the moon goes into eclipse. But there's more. To show you what else there is, I needed to remind you of the skies of Jesus' birth or perhaps conception. Magnificent imagery, Jupiter, crowning Regulus, in Leo, uprises Virgo, the Virgin, clothed in the sun, new moon, Rosh Hashanah, spectacular. And now I turn to the sky of Christ's death and turn on the constellations. And you see the moon has returned to the foot of Virgo, but now it's a full moon, a life fully lived, blotted out in blood. So, so awesome. Absolutely incredible, guys. Why? It, you, you, you'll, you'll see. For those who have been around for a while, you know why I'm getting at these things, right? You've understood what's been revealed here. What we continue to, to dig in and dig in and dig in to, to reveal and bring about more and more revelation and understanding. To draw us closer and closer and closer. Well... How about this? Just so happens, we have Jesus born in 2 BC. We know that it was the third month feast of weeks back then, right? So we've understood this. We have it in the numbers count. But how do we come about these, these Sabbath years? How did all of this come about? Well, it came about because we know that the end of days is 14 years we know that there's a big picture which makes it 21 years which they are the final sevens of a jubilee cycle so all we did was say okay well if that's a seven and then you go down then that's a seven and just go back seven years seven years seven years seven years seven 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 all the way back just keep going 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 until we get to 2 BC and Jesus' birth. Remember, we're, the last year, one of the reasons and the key reason this stuff was off, outside of, of course, the revelation of Scripture, of understanding the, the 5 and 70 years, is that there is no year zero on a Gregorian calendar, and you have to count with a Gregorian calendar right, our regular world calendar, we need to count with it because that's what all the history has gone back and counted with. So even though it's only 500 years old, it traced everything back to those periods of time. So we couldn't have a year zero. And last year, I did it with inserting this count with a year zero. And so everything was 
too far ahead by one year. That's how it happened. When you now take out the year zero as we did last year, having realized, well, wait a second, we can't count on a year zero when a Gregorian calendar, which is the calendar of years we count on, has it all the way traced back without a year zero. So in this, what else do we know happens? We know that at the end of the 49th year or the 14th year of tribulation, the following year is the Jubilee. And what is the Jubilee? It's the first year of the next set of seven years. So all we did was the Jubilee count. Uh, there was a Jubilee, 8990, and we went back throughout all of the counts. So when you see dot, 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 because we just didn't need to do all of them, you get the idea. You can go count it yourself if you want. We go all the way back, and we found in the time of Christ, it equaled the year 2930 BC. Uh, uh, sorry, AD. Okay? So this wasn't some mysterious... Uh, um calculation we just did it based on understanding we couldn't use a year zero knowing the time of jesus's birth and the year of it knowing the death and resurrection year of christ knowing the years he was here knowing the end of days years counting now without a year zero a, a 5 and 74 when they came into the land. And we just counted backwards. We just counted backwards. With all of the sevens and the jubilees all the way back. So I have it here as Feast of Weeks and Feast of Weeks. But remember, once we get to whether you want to say here at any point, you could say feast of weeks, feast of weeks based on Jesus' birth time. But the year we're, we're talking about now goes from feast of trumpets to feast of trumpets, okay? So you can look at it, Nissan one, a Nissan. You can look at it, trumpets to trumpets. You can look at it, uh, um, uh, feast of weeks to feast of weeks. But there's this combination. We're not looking at Nissan anymore. I just showed you that his birth and his conception are both periods of time connected to the end of days. They begin the seven Sabbaths and then the 50 days that follow based on his birth in the beginning. And the tribulation ends based on his conception. And it's really also because of the house of Judah, because they're the ones in the land now. Now, why, why does this count really mean anything? What are, what are we really able to show scripturally? Well, first of all, this is shown, as you just saw, and many others have been able to do it, shown in the sun, moon, and stars. The whole thing about December 25th was the Magi. It really wasn't Jesus' birth. And anybody who has studied these things knows it. It's not a mystery for many people out there. But they still observe it in December. He was born third month, that 15th, 16th. Okay? Now watch what happens. If you know that, and the sun, moon, and stars prove that at Passover in 33 AD was the death and resurrection of Christ. Look, look at the count. I didn't make this up. It's the exact same count that's revealed in the sun, moon, and stars. But why does this get so fantastically, incredibly, perfectly, dare I say, revealed to us. What, what makes this so incredible? It's what we have revealed in Luke. Remember in Luke chapter 3, now in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, John was there and he baptizes Jesus. The Holy Ghost descends. And Jesus begins to be 30 years of age. You guys will remember this, right? So here we are. Jesus begins to be 30 years of age in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Are you ready for this? What does history tell us 
on a Gregorian calendar what the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was. 29 AD. Well, let's get more detail. For the non-inclusive year method, Tiberius, Tiberius' 15th year would have been 29 AD on the Roman calendar. On other calendars, remember, because we're not doing a January to January, we're doing a Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, right? On other calendars in use in the empire, most of which began the year in the autumn, the 15th year would have been autumn of 28 AD to summer of 29 AD. Wait a second, you mean 28 AD to 29 AD when Jesus began to be about 30 in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar when he was baptized while John was still there? And all you got to do to understand it is realize that he was born in 2 BC and there's no year zero on a Gregorian calendar? Hello? How come, how come pastors everywhere aren't talking about this? They've studied. They know that it was 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. It's right there in scripture. They know Jesus began to be 30. All I did was type in what year was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Well, you don't think scholars could have done that? Scholars have done it. That's how come they know what the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was. Was this some fantastic discovery that I discovered here? No. Was this some fantastic discovery that I discovered here? No. Was this some sort of fantastic discovery? Nope. How about that this year, the 29th to the 30th year, equaled Luke chapter 4 as Jesus is then declaring the Jubilee being at hand? How do we know this? Because Jesus began to be about 30, right? In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which is 28, the year 28 into 29. And right towards the tail end of it, in this period, right? In Luke chapter 4, he's declaring the Jubilee is at hand. How do we know this? Not because of something I discovered. It was already known. I just hadn't heard of it yet. Not in the same sense of really looking into it until our brother Ivan in South Africa brought it back to our remembrance. Because listen to this. In Luke chapter 4, verse starting in verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave again to the minister and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Remember what he said? To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. You guys know what this is, right? He was quoting Isaiah 61. And if you go look up these things, go do studies on these things, do Google searches on this. And you will all see that he was making a declaration of the Jubilee according to Isaiah 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Remember what he did? At that point, he shut the book. Why didn't Jesus say the rest of it? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Because it wasn't yet that time. You understand? Because it will come at the end. That final 14th year. He's declaring these things, guys. And look at the look at where it is. What was he declaring? He was declaring the Jubilee. To understand that this was the Jubilee, if you don't know what that means, you go to Leviticus chapter 25. 
Leviticus chapter 25, it tells you that the Jubilee comes what? And thou shall observe seven Sabbaths of years. So seven years times seven years is what? See? Seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be 49 years. Then thou shalt cause the trumpet. Listen carefully. Then you will cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month of atonement. When, when does this happen? Only happens in the 49th year. We've talked about this many times, right? Why is this so important? Because what happens is in the revelation of the end of days, this is the 49th year in the seven times seven Sabbaths. Remember, the 14th year of tribulation is equal to the 49th year. It's the final seven of a jubilee count. Which means, if the trumpet of the jubilee is to be sounded 10 days later on atonement, that means the year began at the Feast of Trumpets. <clears throat> so Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets and 10 more days. When those 10 days are blasted on the Day of Atonement 10 days later, it's the Declaration of the Jubilee. And as we've taught, and you guys all know this, is Matthew, remember the seven years of Matthew's Gospel, of Matthew's Discourse, they are the seven years of the Trumpet Judgments. Marks are the seven years of Seals. And what happens at the end of Matthew's discourse before going to chapter 25 to finish it? It says it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. It's literally talking about the final year, the 14th year of tribulation. The year of Noah, the, the final as it was in the days of Noah, is because Noah's year was one year and 10 days long. You guys all know this, unless you're newer. It starts on the second month, 17th day, and it ends on the second month, 27th day, a year and 10 days later. That's why only Matthew's gospel is the one that says at the when the Lord returns feet down, right, at his coming, it will be as it was in the days of Noah. It's the final year of the judgment and the wrath of God. And what happens? then it's the jubilee 10 days later that's why that's why that's why noah's story is a year and 10 days that's why it's connected to matthew's discourse at the return of the lord feet down on the mount of olives that's why it's not in mark's discourse not in luke's discourse and when we track this it's not something we just made up all we did was count in reverse that's it we simply went in reverse. And everything is there. It's all there. Do you guys remember, this was so powerful when we revealed that in the end of days, we showed that, you know, the, the Feast of Weeks, right? The, the pre-trib is first, like Deuteronomy um, 16. The Feast of Weeks, the pre-trib bride going and the seven-day wedding, and, and it's all connected to the Feast of Weeks. That's the pre-trib that goes first before the, like at the very start, right before the 50 days start. And then what do you have? You have six years as the six days of unleavened bread. And the seventh year as the seventh day is the solemn assembly. Then you have Seven days for the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Solemn Assembly, uh, according to Leviticus 23, is the eighth day. It's not six and then the seventh. But does something happen on the sixth and then the seventh? Yes, it's over for all the, the ones that are the Lord's at that time. It's over after six. And the seventh, they'll all be protected. But now in the seventh of the of trumpet judgments, the seventh year of trumpet judgments or the 14th year of tribulation, it is the day of the Lord, the, the year of his vengeance. It's the, it's the year of Noah, the year in 10 days. But in relation 
to what we see with the birth, uh, um, with Christ coming on the scene, I want you guys to see something. Because it was the end of days that revealed this to us. Jesus is seen at the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of six years of seals. He is seen coming. So like it's like right on this line between the end of the sixth year and the start of the seventh year. He is seen coming, and everybody's in a panic and freaking out. We know this is when he's coming with paradise, with heavenly Mount Zion, when he said, I am coming to receive you unto myself, that there, where I am, there you might be also. And the great multitude rapture will happen in the midst of that seventh year of seals. That's the mid-trip. But when does he come? He's coming on the Feast of Trumpets of the seventh year of seals. Which means he's here for one year where he's defeated in the Ezekiel 39. He's defeated the, the ten kings and the beast who is then cast into the pit. Not the lake of fire, but into the pit. The Lord is now here at mid Seventh year is the great multitude rapture. Then he makes a covenant with the nations. Then trumpets begins. And when trumpets begin, he's here for three and a half years. He's going to be here for three and a half years. Now, we've been told that Jesus' ministry was only three and a half years. But what did the end of days reveal to us? The end of days revealed that there was one year first. There was a year of him reestablishing things, destroying the enemies that came against Judah. And then he's got a three and a half year to fulfill. You would think, well, the first time he came, yeah, it was only three and a half years. And now he's going to fulfill when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. Not feet down on the Mount of Olives, but when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion and he is the, the Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah ben Ephraim that we talk about. When he is the Joshua, Yeshua, high priest and king that we talk about. This is when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion and we know Zerubbabel will be here. He laid the foundation and he's going to be the one responsible in rebuilding during these three and a half years the temple. That's all revealed in Scripture. We've, got, we've covered all of these things. And it would appear, well, three and a half years, and he also served three and a half years the first time. That would be seven years. How fitting, before he's cut off and war breaks out against them for two and a half years. But it's more than three and a half because he was here for the seventh year of seals, brothers and sisters. He was here for the three uh sorry for the seventh year of seals so he's here for one year plus three and a half years that's four and a half years what well, do you know what that revealed from when christ came the first time check it out if jesus began to be 30 in the year of tiberius caesar's reign in the 15th year of tiberius caesar's reign then that means Jesus was here when John baptized him, right? Jesus was here during the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which would have been 28 to 29 AD, exactly as this told us. Which means what? Well, then how was Jesus' ministry only three and a half years? It wasn't. Remember what happened? Remember John the Baptist? Jesus was still around for about two months, right? With John the Baptist. And then John the Baptist was taken into prison. Then he was in prison for about 10 months. So two months before he was taken into prison. Then Jesus comes walking through as Isaiah 9 it revealed in Matthew 4. He comes walking through those two cities, which is two months after his birth. He comes walking through those two cities, having fulfilled, it said, from the was into the is of Isaiah 9. Now John was in prison. And John was then in prison for 10 months for a total of about one year before he was beheaded. 
And as long as John was alive, we showed from Scripture that people were still going to worship or, or going to see John. Not worship, but going to see John. They were still going to John the Baptist, even though Jesus was there. It wasn't until John the Baptist was killed that now everybody turned to Jesus. People have missed this in what took place. Jesus was not only there from the time of his, of his baptism, beginning of his ministry, what they would say, and then it was only three and a half years. It wasn't. It was four and a half years. Because for that first year, John the Baptist was still there. It wasn't until after John's death that they all turned to Jesus. And Jesus, even though his ministry began at his baptism, they didn't all start coming to him until John the Baptist's death, which is the three and a half years that then began Jesus' time. You see how wild that was? Do you know how we discovered this? You see, you can't reconcile this. This Jesus beginning to be 30 in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, 28 to 29. You can't reconcile this to a 33 AD Passover time, death and resurrection. Because there's four and a half years. I never reconciled it because, oh, I just knew this thing. It was the revelation of the end of days that brought the reconciliation. Because I, when we realized that he's here on Heavenly Mount Zion at the start of the seventh year of seals, and then he's got three and a half years before he's cut off because Satan, once the pit opens, is going to have two and a half years, and then the two witnesses are killed, and then what happens? Messiah returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's the days of Noah. And then that year is one year and ten days long. Because on the 10th day, which will be atonement, it'll be the sounding trumpet of the Jubilee. We were able to show it was one year and then three and a half years. We showed it through the revelation of the end of days. And so when we, when we went to, to the scripture to track this out, it proved it out. It's right here on the chart, guys. All of these things are here in order from his birth to when he was baptized to john still being there to the 15th year of tiberius caesar to a declaration of the jubilee which by the way as i said i didn't put these sabbaths there i didn't put these jubilee counts there it was simply a matter of going in reverse from the 14 years that was all we did Everything is there in order. And then look what happens. We go forward, we go forward, we get forward. We go to 1604. And at 1604, the King James Bible began to be written. The King James Bible took seven years and was finished in 1611. Do you think it's just by chance that the Bible of all Bibles, KJV, started and ended in a perfect Shemitah year cycle, a uh, seven-year cycle? And then what happened? Well, then we go to Israel, and we go to the 70-year count of Israel. So now watch this. Now we go to Leviticus 19. I don't need to take too much time in all this. Most of you guys all know this, but it'll, it'll help some that are newer. This is the only place you find this in Scripture of what the Jews are to do in account according to the Lord when they come into the land. And when you shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then shall you count the fruit thereof uncircumcised three years, and it shall be uncircumcised to you, and you shall not eat of it. In the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord, and in the fifth year you shall eat of it. So what ended up happening? We know this very well, right? They came into the land in 1948, right? They came into the land in 1948. 
But when they came into the land in May of 48, it said you needed to plant all manner of trees. Well, they didn't plant trees until February of 1949. So their count couldn't begin until after they've planted the trees. And because, as we know, they're not the house of Israel that are in the land right now. They are the house of Judah that are in the land of Israel. It's the house of Judah. The house of Judah doesn't begin their counts at Nisan. They begin it at, well, lo and behold, they begin their counts at Tishri. And in the end of days revelation, the conception of Christ to the birth of Christ, the count from his birth to his conception, to the end of days being trumpets to trumpets year to year. And the house of Judah, who are the ones in the land, go from trumpets to trumpets. What do we know? We know that Israel then didn't start their official king timing count because of a session compared to non-accession until Feast of Trumpets 1949, which was September 24th. 1949. So if we take the five years of Leviticus 19 and we take the 70 years of all of the revelations that we have throughout Scripture, like one of the famous ones that we have in Levit in um, Psalms, 9, uh, Psalms 90, verse 10, that we have shown this for several years, probably what, almost six years now? The days of our years are three score and ten. That means 70. And if by reason of strength, they're four score years, which means 80. Let me go show new people. We know that it means 70 to 80 years. All right? 70 to 80 years. So if you can live from 70 to 80, if you can make it to those 10 years, through those 10 years, it says, yet is their strength labor, which means travail, trouble, pain, sorrow, wickedness, and sorrow, which means affliction, sorrow, wickedness, vanity, evil. If you can make it from 70 to 80, which is 10 years, it's pain, travail, sorrow, tribulation, wickedness. What are all those definitions? Tribulation. It's the seven years of seals to three years of trumpets, and then you have, for it is soon cut off. That brings you to ten and a half years, which is what? Ten and a half years brings you into the eleventh year, midway through the eleventh year, which would be what? The end of of the three and a half years of the rebuilding of the city streets and temple while Messiah is here and Zerubbabel is doing rebuilding because what happens after ten and a half years? The pit is open. Satan's cast down. The pit is opened and war breaks out against the two witnesses for the next two and a half years. It's exactly as revealed. So you've got 10 in about six months. You've got 10 and a half years, and then what? And we fly away. That has nothing to do with us. That is those flying away on the wings of an eagle in Revelation 12, 14. Exactly after the time when it says Satan has been cast down. When the fifth angel sounds and the pit is opened. It's mid-trumpets. The pit is open. Satan's been cast down. And it's Revelation 12, 14, when they fly away on the wings of an eagle. And they fly away for how long? They fly away for a time, times, which is two, and half a time. They fly away to be out of all of the danger for the last three and a half years of trumpets. But Daniel 12 tells us Satan's time is time times and a half two and a half of the final three and a half years. And when Satan's time is over after the sixth trumpet, the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, just like Zechariah 14. Guys, this is all in the chart. We count the chart. 
we track it, we follow it all the way through. And so if we count that Leviticus count, where do we get? Where do we get? Well, let's let's go see. What did it say? Uh, Feast of Trumpets 1949, add 75 years. Feast of Trumpets isn't September 24th this year, but it's to say Feast of Trumpets 2024. Feast of Trumpets 2024 would be the end of 70 years with the five that came first. It, it, it's right there. It's in Psalms 90 and 10. We know it from many other places as well. There's the Psalms 90 and 10, 70 years, where it's called three score and 10. Okay? Then you have the other way of saying it, three score and 10 years, which is exactly where we know it from Zechariah chapter 1, exactly where we know it from where we teach also from uh, 2 Chronicles 36. And where else do we have it? How about in Daniel chapter 2? How about in Zechariah chapter 7 when it's past tense, those 70 years from Zechariah 1 that said these 70 years? Jeremiah 25 relating to the other 70? But watch this. How about Daniel 9, 24? It's not 70 years. It's 70 weeks. Wait a second. Why, as I bring this to the end, why is Daniel 9 showing us there's a count of 70 years and there's a count of 70 weeks. Well, remember what happens? How does the house of Israel, how does the house of Judah count? The house of Judah begins at Tishri. It begins at Tishri. But the Lord God, from in the beginning, at the true Feast of Weeks, wait, 70 what? Weeks. 70 Shabuas. Shabuas are the Feasts of Weeks. You see, look what happens when it says this. 70 weeks are determined. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, which means there has to be destruction happening in Israel before a commandment can come. And then you have Seven weeks of seals, three and about three and a half years of trumpets. Then, when the three and a half years are over, you have Satan's two and a half years, and then that final year for 14 years. Which means what? Something begins at the Feast of Weeks, at the true Feast of Weeks, which we've shown also through harvests, being August 12th, being the end of 70. Daniel's is the only one that gives us that count of 70 weeks. And 70 weeks, the word means feasts of weeks. The world will tell us that it's over here somewhere. But the revelation of harvests, the revelation of the beginning in the beginning, and the revelation of the sun being off by two months, and the beginning of of creation having been in Taurus. Then the revelation of Isaiah 9 with Luke 4, showing the difference of two months after his birth when it was fulfilled, proves to us at the Feast of Weeks, at the true Feast of Weeks, when the winter wheat, being the first wheat harvest, has been harvested and the loaves are ready, it is right here on the 8th of Av, leaving the revelation that we have known and understood for about five and a half or more years, leaving us exactly 50 days for Luke's discourse, that above portion to complete, and the 14 years of tribulation to begin. Guys, I don't know what more I could say to those who are still skeptical of the revelation of the season and time of the year and the count of 70 that was revealed through the revelation of the 14 years and final jubilee simply being counted back all the way back to the time of Christ 
which is revealed in the sun, moon, and stars, the storyline of everything spoken about in Scripture connected in the sun, moon, and stars to his birth and his death and resurrection, confirmed then with other parts in the Scriptures that have told us when he was baptized, when he was declaring a jubilee, when he took over after John's death. All of it. Every single part of it. I don't know how to hammer this home anymore. Comes to an end in 2024. Guys, I'm pumped. This these these videos are a lot to take in to be able to 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 even try to wrap our minds around the concept of what's coming to see that people over 30 years ago knew this period of time and called it a fourth turning as no other in human history because everyone is progressively bigger and wilder knew that it would be an old order and a rebirthing and a destruction of one thing and an elevation of humanity in another. It is only going to be one of two answers. Either it's going to be brought about by men, or it is going to be the perfect timing of the Lord God. Do you understand now? why i am showing this why i brought this about like why i wanted to put this together having studied these things that are really taking place in the open but still mostly behind the scenes because there's only two options either man's going to do it or the lord god's going to do it and if the lord god's going to do it what is scripture what of harvests on the earth, what of the sun, moon, and stars? What of the history books? What is prophecy? All revealed the times. Is it just, oh, maybe? Kind of? Everything prophetically says 70 years. There has to be an understanding of it. And there's only one left. It's the five and 70. It ends in 2024. And man's on the verge of them creating their own utopia? I think not. Brothers and sisters, I believe wholeheartedly, unequivocally, in what I have understood. This is the year. This is the year. So get ready. Stay excited. Keep diligently seeking and searching the Lord because it's his, it's his Gentile bride, his Enoch bride that is about to be taken out. Those who have faith that he is who he says he is and those that diligently seek him as Enoch said, as it was said of Enoch and believe that God is a rewarder of those who do diligently seek him. And as Luke 21, 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And if it so be, brothers and sisters, that some of us are chosen to remain by the Lord to serve Him, we will be ready and watching and waiting for that knock on the door when He returns from the wedding. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.